Again, in the faded soldier blue, which I think is such a stunning combination, and uh, the, the black boot. I notice that there are a number of um, uh, hidden zippers in these jackets. Now, what are these for, Betsy? They can't be for, is it for mad money? <laughs> well, it depends on where they're placed. They can be wherever you want them. Uh -huh. you know, for the pockets so that no snow gets into it, the zipper holding the hood in because it's easier to put the hood on and off mm -hmm. with the zipper than it is with the snaps. Mm -hmm. Then there's zippers up the side so that the jacket will fit tightly around the hips, keeping that straight, sleek look that it should have. And very often you'll find a zipper hidden in the uh, arm. And Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You'll excuse the fact that I'm out of breath, but about 10 or 15 minutes ago, a tragic thing from all indications at this point has happened in the city of Dallas. Let me quote to you this. And I'll, you'll excuse me if I am out of breath. A bulletin, this is from the United Press from Dallas. President Kennedy and Governor John Colony have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. They were riding in an open automobile when the shots were fired. The president, his limp body carried in the arms of his wife, Jacqueline, has rushed to Parkland Hospital. Uh, and if you'll excuse me if I give some directions and we talk about what we're going to do here for the next few minutes, but Bobby, let's tape this, if you please, particularly the interview with the eyewitness people. It is being taped good. Here's a uh, piece of copy that was rushed to, to me and was torn off from the United Press in Dallas. President Kenny has been shot in Dallas, has been shot in Dallas, Texas. He was shot as a motorcade left downtown Dallas. Mrs. Kennedy jumped up and grabbed the president. She cried, oh no, as the motorcade sped on. An Associated Press photographer, James Algins, 8-L-T-G-E-N-S, reports he saw blood on the president's head. The AP man said he heard two shots but thought someone was shooting fireworks until he saw the blood on the president. He also said he saw no one with a gun. Uh, we were awfully close. Jerry Haynes, as you know, and Mr. Peppermint, we were awfully close to being an eyewitness. We were standing on Houston Street between Maine and the next street over. Jerry, come in, would you please? Uh, and the next street over, we watched the president come by and gave him the applaud that is due the office of the president of the United States. And as he turned left, two or three shots rang out. We thought they were firecrackers until, uh, I thought they did, until the last shot rang out and we heard people screaming. And we rushed over in time to see a policeman standing behind one of the fire poles lo looking around as if to, uh, for some place to shoot, someone to shoot at. Uh, I'd like to remind you here that as the news comes in to the newsroom, we will be on the air. We'll have our eyewitness people here in just a moment. Uh, Vicki, would you see if they need some coffee or something? These people are awfully shaken up. They come awfully close. They were in the line of fire. Jer? I remember, Jay, you said, uh, I thought it was, you know, uh, a uh, firecracker. firecracker or something like that. And then they followed one shot and then a second or two later another shot and then another second or the two third and then one. the third shot and you said the man's been shot at and we both turned no i said my god that's gunshot that's right oh. and then we turned right over we were behind the uh, mr uh, dealer's statue right and we ran over to the uh, right. the cement wall and we saw people beginning to scatter in places and i believe our eyewitness right. was on the ground chair would you do me a favor would you go check in the newsroom now and as the men come in from the field or if they have stories uh, please let me know and also okay. get someone to check with we were supposed to take the feed from KRLD They may still be doing a feed from there. check and let me know and until our news crew gets back in we will sort of use this studio uh, As our headquarters uh, these people and You will excuse me. I don't want to interrupt you I I'm so sorry because I know that you are so upset, but I would like to talk to you for a minute It's a little bit awkward. So the camera shots will have to fall as they may I'm going to stand right here and maybe somebody can give me a chair while we're doing this. May I have your name, please, sir? Bill Newman. And this is Mrs. Newman? Yes, sir. And this is? James Clayton. James, and this is? Billy. Billy, tell me what you saw and what you felt. What happened to you? We were, we just come from Love Field after seeing the president and the first lady. And we were just in front of the triple underpass on Elm Street and we are at the edge of the curve getting ready to wave at the president. So you, were down, uh, you were down under the viaduct, so to speak, weren't you? Well, we were halfway in between uh, on the grass, triple yeah. under, underpass. We were at the curb when the incident happened. But the president's car was some 50 feet still yet. In front uh, of you. In front of us, coming towards us, and we heard the first shot, and the president, I don't know who was hit first, but the president jumped up in his seat, and I thought it scared him. I thought it was a firecracker, because he looked, you know, fair. And then as the car 
got directly in front of us well a gunshot apparently from behind us hit the president in the side, side of the temple did, did you do you think the first gunshot came uh from behind you too i, I think it came from the same location I, uh, apparently back up on the the uh, uh mall i don't know what you call it for the benefit of Norman's plagiar all of you folks have gone out under the viaduct and as you turn going under the viaduct on the left hand side there's some grass uh, do you think the shot came from up on top of the viaduct toward the president? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, not, no, not on the viaduct itself, but up on top of the hill, oh, a little yeah, mound right. oh. of ground there, the garden. How far away do you, would you say that is from where the president was? Uh, a couple of 300 yards, something like that? Well, I have no idea because I, I didn't see the, the, where the gunshot come from. Uh, we were looking directly at the president when he was hit, mm -hmm. and he was more or less directly in front of us. And uh, we didn't realize what happened until we seen the side of his head uh, whenever the bullet hit him in the head. Did you see the blood coming seen the president's head? Yes, sir, we seen that. I seen that. I don't know if my wife did, but I seen that. Oh, yes, sir, it was awful. It, it is awful. I saw it. What kind of work do you do, sir? I'm a construction worker, electrician. Is this the, uh, is this the first time that, uh, that you have seen a president of the United States? Did in, you see in, when he was here in 1961? No, sir. Uh -huh. No, sir. Uh, your housewife yes, sir. took the day off to come downtown and see the president? Yes, sir, we did. We wanted our children to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, were you in the line of fire? I noticed, I, re I remember vividly whenever uh, I walked over and looked over the banister there and saw across the street that you were down on the ground uh, so that uh, to keep out of the line of fire. What was the first thought that struck your mind? Oh, I, I thought it was a firecracker and I saw the blood and I... I had the baby, and I, I just ran, and we, I got on top of him and laid on the grass. I, I was, it just scared me. It was terrible. Did you see anyone else hit besides the... Uh, I, I'm, uh, Governor Conley was kind of turned was to the side, and he grabbed his stomach. Okay. Thank you. Jerry, if anything else comes in, we had a report, and I'd like to say here, for the benefit of you folks who are tuning in, uh, who have tuned in late to watch Julie Bunnell's show, that... Uh, we interrupt this the program and our program will be interrupted all day because uh, it is apparent now that President Kennedy, Kennedy has been shot. We have no word in our newsroom but we are standing by in our newsroom and uh, would you uh, work as a runner with the newsroom and as anything comes in and if you get into the boys that come in that have been been gathering uh, gathering the news please bring them in so that we can have them on the air. Here is another word uh, we know, as we carried here, and all the stations carried this morning, the president spoke this morning in Fort Worth. He flew to Dallas, and that coverage was on. He landed here about 1.30, between 1.35 and 1.40. Vicky, did you get the coffee for the people? Bring it on in. Um, he was to deliver a speech at 1 o'clock this afternoon, and he was on a motorcade and only about, I guess, two or three miles from uh, where he was to make the speech in the trademark whenever this terrible, disastrous thing happened, and it happened in our city. Uh, Secret Service agents that were in the car immediately began following the president. They pulled automatic rifles. Uh, I was an eyewitness to one of the policemen standing there behind uh, a, uh, a tele uh, a light pole, and you'll excuse me if I'm frustrated, you would be too, uh, standing there with a pistol in his hand. The bubble of the president's car was down when the shots rang out. In fact, if I remember correctly, when they took off from the airport, there was no, uh, there was no bubble on the car. The president slumped over in the back seat, face down. Conley lay on the floor of the rear seat. Wounds in the governor's chest were clearly visible. This is from the United Press. The wounds indicated that an automatic weapon was used. Three loud bursts of gunfire were heard before the president and the governor fell. Uh, it, it, just a few minutes before, Jerry Haynes and I, the president smiling and his lovely wife smiling. Uh, did you have, do you have any idea which direction I'm sorry, I forgot your name. I forget my name at this Newman. Mr. Newman, um, do you have any idea which direction... Would you like to go ahead? Excuse, go, go right ahead. I'm so sorry that you're so upset, and I hope we're not prevailing upon your good nature to have you here, except uh, with the news like this. Uh, Mr. Newman, the, do you have any idea which direction the shots came from that hit the president or Conley? Did you say that one of the shots came from one direction and one from another, it seemed like? No, sir. I, actually, I feel that they both come from directly behind where we were standing. Right behind you. Um, the president, it looked like he was looking in that direction. Uh, I, I don't know whether he was hit first. Apparently, he wasn't. It looked like he 
jumped up in his seat, and when he jumped up, well, he was shot directly in the head. And it, uh, I don't know what you call it, the, the mall behind us, but apparently that's, that's, that's where he was. Where, I know that a few minutes after that, when I came over there and, and asked you people if you'd be kind enough to come over and be on our station today, I know that uh, uh, the police were all taking back, uh, taking off up the ramp and over. Everybody was going in that direction. Toward yes, the sir. railroad. Yes, sir. Cars back over in there. I, I just hope the man that, that shot the president, I, I just hope they don't kill him. I hope, I hope he lives. I hope he just lives to regret what he did. And that's all so the comment. The presidential advisor. Excuse me. Everyone, Jerry Haynes, you know Jerry, our Mr. Peppermint. Jerry and I were within 100 yards of where the president was shot. And Jerry, you'll have to, there's another mic here somewhere. Can we excuse our impromptu, uh, here we go. Can we turn this, is this one on now, Bobby? On the Associated Press, someone had asked one of the presidential advisors or companions uh, for any news, and he refused to comment. They asked if he had been wounded fatally. And this was about five minutes ago that came over about the same time I brought that bulletin in. Do we have a report yet from Parkland Hospital? Is there any word from there? No, not yet. Uh, Vicky, will you check in the newsroom and see if uh, see if any of the newsmen are there? See are we, if are we on tape on there? We're both. We're on the air now, and we are taping the, the, the program, too. Uh, your first appearance on television, I take it? Yes, sir. It's not and isn't it a shame that it's under the conditions that we're under now? Yes, sir. It's a shame. Uh, I would like to recap a little bit for those of you who might have turned in late. Jared, go ahead and uh, just do as you have to do to see if we can get some further details in here. And also, you might check with Don Easterwood and see if there is some way we can get a telephone in here that can we can, that we can take beep telephones. Will you, Jer? Or someone? Good. I'd like to uh, I'd like to recap for you the reason we are on the air. And it can best be said by these bulletins from the United Press, and then I will tell you what I know. Uh, the bulletin from the United Press... Thank you, Helen. Uh, President Kennedy and Governor Connolly of Texas have been cut down by assassins' bullets in downtown Dallas. They were riding in an open automobile when the shots were fired. The President, his limp body cradled in the arms of his wife, Jacqueline, had been rushed to Parkland Hospital. A follow-up on that from the United Press. I read just a minute ago. And I can't. Yes, here it is. Let me. I think I can best explain it to you in my own words. We were about a hundred yards. If you're familiar with Dallas, Houston Street is on top of what we call the underpass, and the road curves down and underneath the viaduct. Jerry Haynes and I were standing there, and we heard one shot, and then immediately thereafter another shot. And then a third a little bit later, and I said to Jerry, my God, that those were gunshots. And we ran over, and unfortunately, I'm afraid they were. It's not a new one, just a Is it a recap? Yes. This we have, we have said. Uh, excuse me one minute, and let me... Quote, Clint Hill, a Secret Service agent, this is from the United Press, Clint Hill, a Secret Service agent assigned to Mrs. Kennedy, said he's dead as the president was lifted from the rear of the White House touring car. Mr. Kennedy was rushed to an emergency room, and I believe it's Parkland Hospital, is it Jack? You have nothing? Okay, Jack Draybont, one of our producers, walked in. Other White House officials were in doubt as, as the corridors of the hospital erupted in pandemonium. We have told you where the incident occurred. Uh, what is the name of that street? Where he, was, where he was shot. Well, I suppose it's a continuation of Elm as it goes down. Elm must be that goes on the other path. He was slumped in the back seat of the car, face down. Conley lay on the floor of the rear seat. And also, a few minutes ago, John, uh, the newsman, I can't think of my he, name. No, uh, John Allen, told me that he heard a report from one of the radios, and this is only a report, uh, that there were four or five other people hit. I don't see how there could be, because I know there were only there three. Three shots. There were there were only three shots. Jerry, where's your mic? I got something to say, but might as well have okay. you. Right. Well, I almost didn't go over with you, Jay. Uh, I was not going out to lunch at I know. 12, and you said... I asked Vicky to go over, too, and you had some other work to do, and also Norvell Slater and some of the other people. 
The time is one o'clock. I would guess that this happened. I ask you what time it was at 12.30. So I would guess that this happened about 25 minutes until one o'clock. You, you and I were chatting about 12.30. Uh, some little uh, boys uh, were standing uh, around and I'd signed some autographs as Mr. Peppermint. Right. They asked where Jingles the Dragon was and I said he was in school. And the mother said, well, this is where... A day in Dallas, Texas. He came to see the president. Thank you, Jack. If any of the newsboys come in, or if there are any beep phones come in that we can have transferred here, and you better get Don Easterwood, who is our audio supervisor, to see if we can take them here and put them directly on the air. All right. Put them directly on the air. Representative Albert Thomas of Texas says he has been informed that both President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly of Texas are still alive. Let me repeat that. This is a bulletin. Representative Albert Thomas of Texas says he has been informed that both President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly of Texas are still alive. Thomas made a statement outside the emergency room in which both Kennedy and Connolly are under treatment. He said he had been told the president is still alive, but is in very critical condition. We will be on the air here. We were, I know our boys are developing film now to see if we have any film coverage. We, coverage. we are regrouping in the newsroom, and I, Bob, I would suggest as soon as you can that either you break one of these cameras or one of the other cameras and put it in the newsroom and maybe a headlight on top of the camera and let's move in the newsroom. Uh, get an audio line set up there so that we can work directly out of there and find out exactly what's going on. Uh, we hope to God that this is true. I don't know when I am. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, we have to get a tripod on one of the cameras. We can't get these in. So I see. Good. Okay, fine. Then we'll move in the newsroom. Uh, Representative Albert yeah. Thomas, and this I'll repeat again, Representative Albert Thomas of Texas says he has been informed that both President Kennedy and jo Governor John Connolly of Texas are still alive. He made this statement outside the emergency room in which both Kennedy and Connolly are under treatment. He said he had been told the President is still alive, but in very critical condition. Nora, what do you got? From, uh, Congressman thing. Jim Wright. Same thing. Uh, let's read the whole thing here. Some of the Secret Service yeah. agents threw the, threw the gunfire... Well, that doesn't. Let's see. Some of the Secret Service agents thought, thought the gunfire was from an automatic weapon fired to the right rear of the president's car, probably from a grassy knoll to which the police rushed. And that was confirmed a few minutes ago by Mr. and Mrs. Nunley, who were eyewitnesses to this event. And we will have them back a few minutes later in case some of you are late tuning in to our program. We would like for you to. Uh, we would like for you to hear. Uh, gee, I'm so. Uh, That's okay. Uh, in other words, they fired into the car and it came down. And these people were in the line of fire. There's a call has been sent out. For Congressman Jim Wright of Fort Worth said both Kennedy and Connolly were seriously wounded but still alive. A call has been sent out from some of the top surgical specialists in Dallas, and a call also went out for a priest. It's unusual, uh, the reaction you get when you receive, when you see someone, well, of course, like the president, such a political figure. It's as almost, uh, well, there they were in front of you and I, and it seems to me that the president looked directly, because uh, uh -huh. we were applauding, yes, directly, I'd say at you, probably, because uh, a little taller than I am, and there he was, and he waved at you, and then they rounded the corner, and just a few seconds later, we heard the shots. I would say a minute mm -hmm. before. And the lady uh, was had a camera, I remember, was taking personal films of it. Yeah. And she, I think, was an eyewitness, and she had come running over and crossed the street. Screaming, yeah. Yes. Just a minute, yeah. Don. The cruiser's on its way to Parkland. The cruiser is it's, on its... It's, it's, it's at Parkland. It and is. It'll be feeding in before long. All right, stand by. We, we have a... Our remote cruiser is on its way to Parkland Hospital, and we'll be feeding there as soon as possible. Bob Walker will be there. Will someone please see if they can get a hold of the cruiser and Bob and tell him that we will work audio cues on the air because the people understand the, uh, the type of program it's not a program and we'll understand why if we say uh yeah the notice about the call going out for the priest well i think this one sentence uh sums up the situation as of this moment a call has been sent out from for some of the top surgical specialists in dallas and at the same time a call has gone out for a priest it's uh, three minutes after one o'clock jerry somewhere around 12.35 this took place, so 30 minutes ago. Would you, while I get a breath and a drink of water here, recap the situation as to until now? Right. We'll be moving in our newsroom so that we can talk to the boys in the news department as they come in. Our cruiser is now on its way to Parkland Hospital. 
Uh, we will keep you up to date as soon as... It's at Parkland Hospital. It is at Parkland now. They still have to hook up, though. And they're trying to get it hooked up. Jerry, I'll be back in a couple of hours. Right. Well, as an announcer, it's my duty, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, stand by in the announce booth here at WFAA-TV. And we began our feed of the president's arrival this morning. Uh, it was at 9 o'clock. And he was uh, speaking at Fort Worth, of course, as you saw on Channel 8 or any of the other television stations in this area. And he made a very fine speech lasting some 15 minutes in length. Then he went outside and uh, was in the jet, took off and arrived in Love Field. Bob Walker, our Channel 8 newsman, stood by as we, in turn, fed the other television stations on the president's arrival in Love Field. And he was met by Mayor and Mrs. Cabell, by Mr. Eric Johnson, another of the dignitaries who were to uh, share the speaker's table at Market Hall this afternoon as he was to give an address. And at the time, uh, Bob Walker remarked after the president met the official welcoming group as he uh, went out of his way to shake the hands of those who had lined the fences, having come out to Love Field this morning very early and uh, ignoring the possibility of rain. Of course, the sky is cleared and the clouds weren't to be seen, but the president shook all of the hands and we saw the Secret Service men and they followed him. And I wondered uh, at the time just how effective, of course, you uh, have to be as effective as you can be, but there are human errors and you can't cover all areas. And the Secret Service men, who uh, must have the most difficult task in the world in guarding the president, were behind him at every angle as he shook the hands of everyone. I noticed a uh, high school girl shook the president's hand and then at about, uh, oh, I'd say 15 minutes until 12, the motorcade left Love Field heading for its predetermined route down uh, Lemon Avenue into the downtown area, and they were to come down Commerce and turn right on Houston, rather to come down Main and turn right on Houston over to Elm, turn left on Elm, and down under the now uh, spot that uh, will be remembered, I'm sure, as the years pass, as the place where an attempt, and we hope the attempt remains in the press releases, was made on the life of the President of the United States. Here is the, uh, in case you have tuned in, uh, you probably know, of course, as much as I do, but this is the bulletin that came over the United Press, so I'll be repeating. But this is what has happened so far. President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly of Texas have been cut down by assassins' bullets. They were shot as they turned toward downtown Dallas in an open car. The president, his limp body, and the arms of his wife was rushed to Parkland Hospital. The governor also was taken to the same hospital. Clint Hill, a Secret Service agent assigned to Mrs. Kennedy, made a statement. Uh, no, he said he's dead, but he isn't. But this is what the gentleman said at the time as the president was lifted from the rear of the White House touring car. Mr. Kennedy was rushed to an emergency room in the hospital. Other White House officials were in doubt as the corridors of the hospital erupted in pandemonium. The incident occurred just east of the triple underpass facing a park in downtown area. President Kennedy's mother and father have been advised that their son was shot in Dallas. And the Secret Service says the president remains in the emergency room at the hospital while Governor Connolly was moved to the general operating room. One Secret Service man was overheard telling another that there was no need to move the president because emergency facilities were entirely adequate in the emergency room and two Roman Catholic priests have been summoned to the emergency room where the president is. A White House spokesman said someone had asked for the priests. Uh, we got audio. You, you fellas, don't be afraid. If you have something to do, go ahead and say it, you know, because the people understand. Uh, I'd like to ask this of you. Please do not call the police department. Do not call the radio stations, the television stations. Do not call the hospital. Particularly, do not call Parkland Hospital. Those lines are needed. Every telephone in that building will have to be made available to the Secret Service and to the people who are working to save the life of the President. Please do not call the, the, the Parkland Hospital. Do not call the television station. Our switchboard has been tied up for the last 25 minutes now. Do not call. In fact, it might be a good idea with all the long-distance calls coming out here, unless a, a telephone call is absolutely necessary, not to make the call. Uh, are we ready in the newsroom now? Yes, we, are. we are. Okay. Bobby, why don't you just take your shot over there and pan around, and we will walk over and pick up the audio.
let's turn the mic on. I can't hear you, Johnny. What do you want? You want me to move back a little bit? Is it all right now? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the newsroom of our radio and television station. As you can see, most of the boys are out. Uh, Bert. Let's see. Let's get reorganized here. Grab that cable over there. We're on the air, Bert, and let's talk to you just a minute here. Is this all right? Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you the chief cameraman and assistant news director of WFA Television. This is Bert Schiff. Bert, we have brought the people pretty much up to date. Uh, would you tell them exactly what you know as of this point? Well, Jay, I was standing at the uh, trademark waiting his arrival there. All of a sudden, the, uh, we saw them approaching. They didn't slow down. As a matter of fact, they were going 70, 80 miles an hour past us. I, everybody was unknowingly, uh, didn't know what happened there at the trademark. And then uh, I jumped in a police car and went to Parkland. When I got there, I found that, uh, that nobody knew too much about where he was hit, but they knew that the president was shot in the head. This is what I've been told now, Jay. The president was shot in the head. Conley was shot in the chest. Both of them are still alive when I left the hospital. Do you have some film? And uh, Yeah, I have film well, at the hospital. You get the film and see if you can get it developed real quick. Yeah, and we'll I will. Put it on the air and and uh, run through. Uh, one thing, one quote we got out there was Yarbrough said the scene was too gruesome to describe. I know. And uh, that's, I've spent most of my time, so I'm going to get the film ready now. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, let me bring you up to date. Jerry Haynes and I were within about 100 yards of where the president was shot this afternoon on, on the grassy mole there. And you will understand if uh, we repeat ourselves, it's for the benefit of the people who have tuned in late. We are pre presently televising over WFAA television. The... Uh, from our newsroom, all that we know as of this moment, and as you can imagine, some of the stories that you will hear are not factual. The story that I told a few minutes ago about, we heard that six or eight people were wounded. This is not true because we only heard three shots and Jerry and I were witnesses. We will have film on the air. Our mobile cruiser is either at or rushing to Parkland Hospital. We will have word from there. Uh, there was a gentleman who uh, was an eyewitness. Helen, is he here? Mr. Nunley, would you come in, please? Uh, when I first looked over the balcony to where the chaos was taking place, this gentleman and his wife and two children were on the grass. Now, once again, if you joined us originally when we cut into the program about a quarter to one o'clock, uh, you heard his statement. Mr. Nunley, would you tell us once again exactly what... Mr. Newman, I'm sorry. Look right there. Mr. Uh, Newman, will you tell us exactly what you know? Well, my wife and uh, my two sons were standing at the curb looking at the president approaching us. And we heard a blast, and the president looked like that he right jumped up in his seat. And by that time, he was directly in front of us. And then he, we seen him... Uh, get shot in the side of the head and he fell back in the seat and mm -hmm. Governor Conley was holding his stomach and the shots and were almost simultaneously weren't they? Yes sir, they were probably 10 seconds apart. Do you know apart. who fired the third shot? I didn't hear, a I, I don't recall a third shot, there may have been. I, at, we hit, my family hit the ground and I don't recall a third shot. Uh, I just couldn't, I'm not certain of that, I do know I heard two shots. Yeah, I heard three. I know you there heard were three. Well, yeah, I said to Jerry after the second shot, I said, my God, those are gunshots. And I, uh, sure enough, they were, unfortunately. Let me bring you up to date now. Uh, yeah, I understand that we're having trouble in here with a pickup, so we'll move back to the studio. Is that correct? Just a minute. Ed, what is it you said? This is Ed Pfeiffer, our station manager. Excuse me just a minute. You want to go have a cup of coffee, and we'll be right back. Better, Jay, if we move this back into the studio, okay. uh, and that it's very difficult to hear on the air. The audio's bad. Okay, good. Okay, we'll move back in the studio. Jerry is standing by in there now. Uh, let's see. Bert, as soon as the film is ready, you'll let us know so we can run it. Has ABC called from New York? I have no idea. Okay, let's go back in the studio. Thank you very much. Take, take, uh, take one, Rod. The uh, time now. We're back at Studio here where the news is given each day and the weather and the sports known as Studio B here at WFAA Television. Time now is uh, in 15 seconds will be uh, 1.15, so it was approximately, yeah.
Yes, sir. See, I'm trying to find out. Uh, uh oh. Uh, I beg your pardon? Has it been fed live? So, speak, go ahead, Ed, I can. It's fed live on the networks. Good. From here. I understand that we are feeding two of the networks at this moment, is that correct? Right. Uh, well, so since this is the case, I think we should start from scratch again and explain to you what happened. Would you see that Mr. Nunley or Mrs. Nunley come back in so that we can talk to them? Jerry Haynes and I were about 100 yards. My name is Jay Watson. We're about 100 yards from where President Kennedy was shot this afternoon at approximately 12.35 Central, Central Standard Time. Uh, the President, we know that he has been shot. We know that the top surgical people in Dallas have been called to Parkland Hospital and two we priests. all two and two priests have been summoned. And I think that sums up the situation as of now. It says here, Jay, that President Kennedy has been given blood transfusions in Parkland Hospital in Dallas in an effort to save the President's life after he and Texas Governor John Connolly were shot as the President was traveling on the outskirts of Dallas in a motorcade. Good. Jared, let me bring... Uh, sure. I like Newman, you Mrs. Newman, would you come in, please, and let me get your account of that. I would miss you to sit right over here. And a little boy. Did you get some coffee, finally? I don't drink coffee. Well, would you like to have something? I know that no, you... No, um, my stomach's kind of churning. I'm afraid that I'm... Mrs. Nunley. No, Newman. Newman. I've been calling you. I'm sorry. I don't even remember my own name, really. It's terrible. Tell me what happened. We were standing next to the curb so the children could see the president, and the car was just up a piece from us, and this shot fired out, and I thought it was a firecracker. And the president kind of raised up in his seat, and uh, I thought, you know, he was kind of going along with a gag or something. And then all of a sudden this next one popped and Governor Conley grabbed his stomach and kind of laid over to the side. And then another one, it was just all so fast, and President Kennedy reached up and grabbed, looked like he grabbed his ear and blood just started gushing out. And uh, my husband said, quick, get down. And I grabbed the baby and we ran and laid down on the grass and I got on top of him. It was just, just right by us when it all happened, just right in front of us. It was... It's well, when I saw you looking over the balcony there, you and your you, your husband and your two little children, well, who's this uh, one now? This is James Clayton. Hi, baby. Can you say hi? He's got some candy. What's he doing? He didn't talk. He's cute. He didn't say anything. Oh, he can talk. He can say thank you. Have you seen President Kennedy before? Uh, we were out at the airport, and we didn't get a very good view of him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we decided we'd try to get downtown to see him because uh, Billy, that's our youngest son, is getting old enough that he remembers things like that and we wanted him to be able to say that he saw President Kennedy. And, and uh, now he will be able to say that he saw President Kennedy when he was shot. Uh, yes, uh, he's already saying, Mother, why would someone want to shoot President Kennedy? Um, children, you don't realize how they catch on to things, but he's already talking about why would they want to kill him? And, and that's a question that everyone would You didn't ask. see anybody? You didn't no, see anybody. Uh, it, it happened so fast that you didn't have a chance to, to see anything. It, it just was too fast. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for coming down. I appreciate your time very much, and I'm, I know that you're upset, and I hope that we didn't embarrass you in any way. No. And uh, good luck to you and your family and to your thank two you. little boys, and tell your husband, too, that we appreciate his time and trouble very much. Thank you. Uh, you people who are looking in will excuse us if we sort of get organized on the air here. Bobby, uh, I understand that we have some film that is uh, that we will be that is in the process that is being. Bert Chip has some, I think, one of our news. But he, it is being processed at the moment, so we will have that film. We are rushing our mobile cruiser. Physically, it might be a good idea for people who are watching who have never been to Dallas before. To, uh, I think, I'll tell you what let's do, is Sam Smith around, our artist, Sam, if we can have a piece of cardboard and a piece of chalk, we'll try to explain to you exactly where the location is in Dallas, Texas. Uh, will someone see if uh, we can have something to do a little artwork? He's on his way, good. But we'll, we'll, we'll have, a, uh, we'll have a, a little drawing for you of where it is this morning. I tell you, Bob, is Turner, uh, is he still directing? Yes. Okay, Bob. 
If you will get the film out, the videotape that we made this morning, and take about four or five minutes out of it, the part where we had President and Mrs. Kennedy shaking hands with the people up at the rail, let's run that in just a few minutes, if you will. Vicki, would you get me some coffee, please, man? The, motor uh, the motorcade, for all practical purposes, uh, was finished. Uh, of course, they were to yeah. go down the rest of the, and go under what we call in Dallas our triple underpass. Elm Street runs down uh, gently sloping uh, incline as it goes west and the president's official car had just turned off of another street main which is one block south of elm through all the crowd because yes. from there on out to what we call the uh trademark is a f uh, eight lane freeway mm -hmm. and there's some so, industrial areas and a few of the people off for lunch but the president for the had uh, seen all of the crowd who had gathered and so as he turned the presidential uh, motor car going down at an incline of about uh, oh, 15 to 20 degrees for all practical purposes the uh, parade in dallas was over and we had turned ourselves to go back to wfaa when those three shots rang out at the time not sounding like shots but uh, you did remark yeah, i said my god those are gunshots and the people started screaming and we ran over and looked over yeah, go ahead, set it up here. I don't the gunshots occurred about 12.35 this afternoon, Let's... and it is now 1.20 Central Time. Okay, uh, we need something to write with, and then we'll be in business to try to show you where this took place in the city of Dallas. I'm not... Uh... The tape's ready, Jay. The tape is ready? Well, while we draw this out, this tape was made earlier this morning in a feed that WFAA picked up and originated for the stations in Dallas, WFAA, KRLD, KTVT, and uh, WBAP. Uh, he arrived at about 1, about 11.35, almost to the hour from when he was shot at Love Field. Let's take about four or five minutes, uh, and I'll tell you when, Bobby. Let's take the tape. Now, this is pre-taped. This is a tape that we made this morning. Let's look at that, shall we? Now running over to get behind other fences to catch a better glimpse of... Uh the uh, caravan as it would leave will leave here shortly and go to downtown Dallas. The president is up to the fence now, shaking hands with people. The president and his wife are right up on the fence. The press is standing up high, getting a lot of shots of this. He's uh, done as he has done in several places. He's broken away from his uh, planned uh, plan and uh, gone right up to the fence to shake hands with people. This is great for the people and uh, makes the eggshells even thinner for the Secret Service whose job it is to guard the man. But the audience loves this. Mrs. Kennedy's uh, beautiful pillbox hat was the only thing that gave it away, I saw the hat, and I knew they were there. And of course the press going high and shooting right down below, as the president and his wife kind of moving along the gate. People yelling at them, people running on the inside now, trying to come down to this end of the gate, this end of the fenced off area, hoping that the president and his wife will move along the fence. Uh, they didn't expect this. Now as he becomes more visible down to this end, the people cheer. And here they come, right down toward us. I can uh, see Mrs. Kennedy. And they're going to come right on down and shake hands with everybody. Mrs. Kennedy gave a lovely smile and a wave at that time. Mrs. Kennedy right up. There's the president shaking hands with the people. He's... Uh, waving at a lot of people, smiling, Secret Service men all around. Boy, this is something. They break right away and come right up to the fence, and the people who waited all morning in this fence are rewarded with a glimpse, and a lot of them with a close look and a handshake for the President of the United States and his wife. And he's coming right down to, uh, toward us and toward our uh, fine camera positions here. The press is having a field day. Somebody perched up on somebody's shoulders. Secret Service right along with the president, of course. The president passes right in front of a Dallas police officer, right in front of our cameras now. 
Somebody patted his shoulder. Mrs. Kennedy coming along behind him, grinning all the while. The president saying, thank you very much. If I may be permitted to, to read a presidential lip movement. In the side of... This is a bonus for the people who have waited out here. Now, Mrs. Kennedy, right along behind him, the president still moving uh, over towards some phone booths that were set up for the press. The people surging up toward that fence. We interrupt this. The uh, wait just a minute. I hear just a moment. It's a trademark. All right. Secret Service, Let's go to the Secret Service. Let's go to the trademark, Bobby. Is that correct? All right. Take it. Let's see what we have. Final as of this morning. Uh, rift has existed for a long time in the Democratic Party in Texas, and this rift. The Democrats will tell you whether they be conservatives or loyalists or liberals or moderates or whatever faction of the Democratic Party they belong to in Texas. They all say that this is uh, just an inter-party fight and we can all get together when the president comes to town. Well, finally they did get together. The big uh, bone of contention had been whether or not Senator Ralph Yarbrough, who is considered in, certainly in the liberal wing of the party, would be seated at the head table. He does not get along too well with Vice President Johnson or with Governor Connolly. The word was that last night uh, the uh, senator refused to ride in the motorcade in the same car with Vice President Johnson. Uh, but today, all was to have been pretty much peaches and cream, uh, as it were. Uh, they were all going to sit at the head table and break bread together on this Friday, the 22nd of November. And then, before they could ever reach this market hall, the word is that the president has been killed, that one of his agents is dead, and the governor of Texas is wounded. From the trademark in Dallas, Texas, this is Eddie Barker. Now, on my right and on your left is a crude, and you'll excuse the artwork, with apologies to you, Sam, of where, in Dallas, the shooting took place today. Uh, Dallas is off to your left. This is Main Street. This is the county courthouse and the jailhouse in this block here. This is the triple underpass that we have referred to. This is where President Kennedy Johnson, and I, as I understand it now, a Secret Service man, was shot at about, tw and Conley, I'm sorry, Conley was shot at approximately uh, 12.35 today. And from our eyewitness that you saw earlier, was shot from up in here. This is an overpass going over these streets. We call it our triple other pass because there's another one. Was shot from here. Conley arrived last night in Fort Worth to a warm reception. It was raining up until about in Dallas and in Fort Worth up until about, um, oh, I guess, 9.30 or 10 o'clock this morning. And everybody was saying, well... The president brought the rain with him because those of you who have been in this area recently know how bad we have needed the rain. Uh, he made a speech this morning at 9 o'clock that was carried on television. About, at a, I beg your pardon? Let's go back to the network now and see what they have. The operating room that the vice president is fine. She was taken back into another first floor room where Johnson originally had gone. Asked if her husband also had been wounded. She shook her head negatively. She said he had not been. Secret Service man pushed reporters away and permitted no more questions. Of course, you can imagine the confusion, in the emergency circumstances, uh, the confusion that must exist around that hospital. Now we understand that we are ready to switch to Washington for a report from there. We are ready to go to Washington. Come in, Washington. We are ready to switch to Washington for a direct report from there, but for some reason, uh, under the circumstances, we seem to be having a little difficulty with that, which I'm sure will be cleared up in a moment. Come in, Washington. We were told from our control room here in New York that Washington was standing uh, by with a report, but uh, we've been 
unable to reach them at this moment. I'm sure that uh, in a matter of seconds, perhaps in another minute or two, we will be able to reach Washington. Did you have something else, no, Silverman? I just thought we might recap for those who probably heard about it uh, just a few moments ago. I think that's uh, a good idea. It happened that the president and uh, Governor Connolly were shot on their motorcade as it entered an underpass uh, while going through a downtown Dallas. And when the shots were first fired, there were thought to be three. That uh, later was confirmed there were four shots. The president uh, fell over face down. Governor Connolly apparently was wounded in the body. Uh, he fell forward. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy uh, leaped up and cried, oh no, and uh, tried to uh, hold the president's head up. The blood was seen on the president's head. And uh, a Secret Service uh, agent apparently was shot by one of the uh, assassin's bullets as well. And of course, you have them from there on. Thanks very much, Ed. Uh, in case you did join us late or uh, had not heard the news, those are the facts uh, so far as we know them up to this time. And last... I'm receiving word now. We have, re we have received word that two priests who were with the president have reported that the president is dead. Now, here, here again, we must, we must uh, emphasize that this is not an official announcement. It has not been announced by the White House or anyone in the official party traveling with the president. But uh, the Associated Press quotes two priests who were with the president stating that he died from the bullet wounds or wound inflicted upon him by a sniper. We have to assume that it was a sniper who fired from a considerable distance. The president was given the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church at about one o'clock uh, Dallas time. And at that time, the first reports were that the president was still alive. However, uh, this latest word says that uh, the priests were under the impression the president was dead at the time the last rites were administered. Now, we, of course, are going to keep the air here, and we will bring you whatever reports come in as they come in from uh, the wire services, from our reporters on the scene, and from Washington and Dallas directly. We will be going to uh, Washington before long for a direct report from there. Ed Silverman is sitting here beside me. He has a telephone uh, to Dallas and is in touch with uh, our reporter, Bill Lord, who is at the hospital and has been uh, in touch with people at the scene. Ed, is there anything uh, new there? No, there is nothing uh, new, uh, Ron. Uh, Bill left the phone to check with the sheriff's office. He did confirm the uh, death of the Secret uh, Service agent, the fact that at least a dozen eyewitnesses have been uh, brought in for interrogation and the fact that one suspect has been picked up. He is in there being questioned now. There have been no details. Everyone is being very close-mouthed in the sheriff's office. And, of course, there is a great deal of rumor, uh, Bill mentioned, a great deal of rumor, as is uh, understandable at a time like this. So we would hesitate to pass any of that along. We'd stick strictly with the facts as we get them. Thank you, Ed Silverman. Now, we're receiving a, uh, a report here. The United Press reports... Uh, the United Press reports that the president died at 1.35. That would be 1.35 Eastern Time, I presume. Uh, that would have been uh, about uh, 1.35 Central Time. That was only about two minutes ago. Now, that, again, is a, a United Press International uh, report. It is not attributed. We do not know uh, whether that is an official announcement by uh, anyone in the Kennedy party. We have another photograph of Mr. Kennedy in the motorcade, which was taken minutes before the assassination attempt. This is a uh, still photograph of the president in the motorcade. You see he's riding in an open car, and we're informed that the time that the shot struck him he was standing in that car, uh, unfortunately, apparently making a good target for uh, the sniper who was hiding somewhere and may have fired from a considerable distance, uh, probably with a high-powered rifle, considering the accuracy with which he shot. And uh, also the fact that uh, one of the Secret Service agents was killed. The Secret Service agents normally walk directly beside the car on either side. We do not see any in this photograph. 
but usually uh, two or three Secret Service agents will walk on either side of the car uh, so that they are there to uh, spot any, anyone who looks like a, a troublemaker. Government sources now confirm, we have this from Washington, government sources now confirm that President Kennedy is dead. So that apparently is the final word and an incredible event that I am sure no one except the assassin himself could have possibly imagined would occur. Bert, a black day. Indeed it is, Jay, but uh, from the last report from police, they are converging on an area in the 300 block or somewhere near the 300. Right, let's not give it. We've made it too many people. Oh, uh, well, they're already out there. But anyhow, in Oak Cliff, uh, and they believe they might have the assassin out there. They're looking for a white male, 35, about 5'8 uh, in height. He got a white shirt, and uh, that's about all I know right now. But they are putting an unusually great number of policemen out in that area. And so the, we, that's why we take some strength into this, in this uh, just routine uh, call. That, and also, there's been a report that a policeman's been shot out there. Well, he's shot and killed, I don't know. Well, is it confirmed now that the Secret Service man and, uh, well, let's see, we don't know the condition of Connolly now, do we? No, we don't. He was in... He is all right. Good. And, uh, of course, he was shot in the chest, and uh, the first details from the Parkland Hospital are very sketchy. Mm -hmm. it just, uh, we talked to uh, Congressman Wright, we talked to uh, Senator Ralph Yarborough, and they were, so, as you'll see on the film in a moment, are very visibly shaken. It, uh, well, I've got... No, Bobby, let's hold the film, please. Uh, of, course the, uh, of course, the film that Bert is talking about is unedited and it was rushed through and we'll have more film throughout the day. Uh, uh, as, as the boys bring it in, we are not making any attempt to edit it down as you would see on our regularly news, scheduled newscast because it's impossible. And you understand that, I am sure. The time now is 20 minutes until 2 o'clock Central Standard Time. The president died five minutes ago. He arrived in Fort Worth last night. This morning at 9 o'clock in Fort Worth, he made his speech. At 10, at 11.35, he arrived in Dallas. And at 1, at 12.35, is that right? At 12.35, he was shot, and an hour later was pronounced dead. Bert was telling me out at, out at the, um, out at the um, trademark, you knew something was wrong the minute the car came by at 70 or 80 miles it an was, hour. It was going full speed. And we thought that that uh, that they were just going to slow down, but they didn't. They went right on past it, and, and for about, uh, they went, had to go about a mile from the trademark to the uh, to the Parkland Hospital. And they were going in top speed, and we hadn't even a chance to get any pictures. Mm. We were a good distance away, but we hopped in the police car and went on out to Parkland, I where see. we got these... Bert, why don't you uh, scoot up for just a minute and let Pierce Allman come in. Pierce was uh, is a program director of WFAA Radio. Pierce, how are you? I'm a little bit shook right now, Jay. Uh, I didn't know until I got back and went into the newsroom just now that the president had died. Mm -hmm. Because uh, where I was, I was locked in the Texas School Book Depository Building. I headed for there right after the shots. And... Uh, they weren't letting anyone... Pierce, excuse me here. We have our tape ready to roll. You're on the air. You're on network feed. We are feeding now. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen from WFA TV in Dallas, what you are about to see is the first eyewitness report that we could line up. This program went on the air in Dallas, Texas, approximately 10 minutes after the president was shot. Then after that, we will have film that is completely unedited that was made, and we, we, and frankly, we do not know what's on the film. So right now, let's run the videotape of the program this morning with the eyewitness. Let's go. About 10 or 15 minutes ago, a tragic thing from all indications at this point has happened in the city of Dallas. Let me quote to you this. And I'll, you'll excuse me if I am out of breath. A bulletin. This is from the United Press from Dallas. President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly have been cut down by assassins' bullets in downtown Dallas. They were riding in an open automobile when the shots were fired. The president, his limp body carried in the arms of his wife, Jacqueline, has rushed to Parkland Hospital. 
I'd like to remind you that this is Jay Watson. I'm speaking to you from the studios of WFAA-TV in Dallas. The tape that you just have witnessed was played back approximately 10 minutes on our station uh, after the president was shot this afternoon in Dallas. Uh, the tape of the eyewitness, there were others. Uh, these, the two people, uh, I, as you could see, we were in a state of confusion there at the moment, but at least uh, we did have the eyewitness report for you in case you have tuned in late. Government sources in Washington say that President Kennedy is dead. He was shot at approximately 12.35 this afternoon in Dallas, Texas. The gentleman on my left and on your right is Bert Shipp, who is in charge of the photographers in our newsroom. And Bert, uh, you have some film. Just a minute. Bobby, is the film ready to roll yet? Hello. No, they're queuing up the film now that Bert took at Parkland Hospital, as I understand it. Uh, Jay, it's going to start out uh, of some brief scenes at the Market Hall, okay. or at Trademark, where the uh, president was due to arrive. It's about uh, probably a mile from the scene of the uh, downtown shooting. And, uh, of course, we had no word at Market Hall as to what went on downtown. Roll the film. And it was uh, a complete mystery. The police didn't even know. But we knew... As you'll see by halfway through the film, the police went on past the Market Hall area, or Trademark rather, and uh, and on it to That's Parkland right. Hospital. Bob, whenever you're ready, go ahead and roll. Let's see what we got. Excuse me. No. Oh, this is a shot. There we go. Here's Market. Uh, there's Market Hall. Trademark is right across the street from there. They had a big welcome sign for the president there at the corner of Industrial and Stimmons. It uh, says, Welcome, Jackie. And now, this was the place where the president was supposed yeah. to make his speech. Here's some uh, uh, a gentleman carrying signs. I guess you'd call them gentlemen. They uh, had these signs. They were, weren't causing any trouble. They were run off uh, moments after this, uh, told that there was private property and they couldn't be around there. And uh, they uh, wouldn't talk to us other than they said their signs spoke for themselves. Here's some of the crowd, 450 Extra policemen called on duty. Everybody waited anxiously and waited and waited and waited. There's the policeman ushering a fellow by the name of Joyner from Grand Prairie back across the street. The boys had their mouths taped up so they wouldn't be able to answer any questions. Now there goes the president on up the hill there. He's been, uh, this is after we found out there was something wrong. And uh, Speeding past. Yeah, them. and here's the disappointed crowd left there at the trademark. I went up on the the uh, roadway there to ask some policemen. Here we go to the hospital. There's uh, homicide detectives in front of us. There's Parkland Hospital. There's the entrance. Police cars all over the place. There is uh, Congressman Wright. He's he's teary-eyed as you could imagine. And there's the presidential uh, limousine. The Secret Service men shaking it over. There's right again. Right in Yarbrough. Yarbrough. There's uh, the Secret Service man is taking its type of a mattress or something out of the back of the car there. There's Chief Curry. He just couldn't believe it. He had put everything he had into this visit and uh, gave the uh, men all types of instruction. There's the inside of a car. I don't know whether that must have been Conley's car. There's some more shots of the everybody waiting expectantly. At this time, no one knew anything. And there goes Ms. Lincoln, the president's press uh, secretary, inside. And there's uh, uh, Yarborough again, Senator Yarborough. And he says the site was too gruesome to describe. And there's a final parting shot from Parkland. <coughs> the film of... And the quality of the film, of course, you can understand, uh, and also the fact that it was not edited. This gentleman is Bob Walker, news director of WFAA Television. Bob, do you have some last-minute items there? Uh, uh, just uh, this, that uh, Vice President is on his way to Washington, where he will be uh, sworn in. The uh, President's children are on the second floor of the uh, White House and have not been told as yet uh, that their father was killed. And uh, the White House news staff... Uh, is under a state of complete, uh, White House staff, I should say, is under a state of uh, complete collapse. Uh, first reports uh, said that President Kennedy was shot from an overpass. Uh, our WFAA-TV reporter, Mal Couch, 
saw the gun emerge from the upper story of the warehouse, which has turned out to be the second floor of the Texas Book Depository, which is a Bob, familiar let me, sign. Let me, let me interrupt you here. We're, this is Jay Watson and Bob Walker, WFA-TV in Dallas. Let's switch now to ABC in New York. This is Ron Cochran at the ABC News headquarters in New York. Just to recapitulate what uh, most of you, I'm sure, already know by now, President Kennedy is dead. The 35th President of the United States, born May 29, 1917, in Boston, the first Catholic president ever elected. He was also the youngest man ever elected president. He was the first American chief executive to face the possibility of nuclear warfare. He risked it with a show of force to protect American interests. Later, he succeeded in achieving an accord with Russia limiting nuclear tests, and that occurred only uh, recently. Now we go to Washington for a direct report from Ed Morgan. This is Edward P. Morgan in Washington. I have just come from the White House. The president is dead. The word came to the White House from a doctor in Dallas. The scene in the White House is a mixture of stunned disbelief anger and heartbreak. I saw McGeorge Bundy, the president's chief advisor on international security affairs. His eyes were red-rimmed. He was silent. He shook my hands in silence. By coincidence, I happened to have lunch with Ralph Dungan, one of the other president's, one of the president's other top advisors. We drove back to the White House together. On our way back, we saw clots of students at George Washington University standing in the street listening to the horrible news on the radio. When I got to the White House, secretaries were sobbing audibly in the corridors. Charles Horsky, the president's advisor for District of Columbia Affairs, was walking back and forth in the corridor with his hands beating his forehead. Hubert Humphrey happened to be the, at the lunch that Dungan and I attended at the Chilean embassy, where we both got the news. The senator's first reaction was one of high indignation and his audible reaction was unprintable. He immediately went to the Senate where the news had already been given. There is no official spokesman, ironically enough, at the White House at this moment. Pierre Salinger, the President's press secretary, is not in Texas, but at last reports was on the way in the air from Honolulu to Tokyo with Secretary of State Dean Rusk. At this moment, it seems hardly the time, and yet the inexorability of events make it necessary to report what the order of events is now. Vice President Lyndon Johnson will be the next President of the United States. According to the processes of law, he must be sworn in as soon as possible. Calvin Coolidge was sworn in in New England at midnight, as I recall, after Warren Harding had died in San Francisco of blood poisoning. Harry Truman was sworn in, you may remember, in Washington in April 1945 after Franklin D. Roosevelt had died of a stroke in Warm Springs, Georgia. This news at this point has so stunned the Capitol that there is no rational progression of events. Nobody is thinking about much of anything except the indescribable, incredible fact that the man who came out of Fort Worth with his customary PT boat vigor at seven o'clock this morning, made two speeches in Fort Worth, and then went on to Dallas, is now a man in his 46th year, the youngest president of the United States ever to be elected as such, the first Roman Catholic ever to be elected as such, is dead. This is Edward P. Morgan in Washington. You got it, New York. This is Ron Cochran in the ABC News headquarters in New York. Senators, we're told, crowded around two news tickers waiting for word of the shooting. Many of the senators remained slumped in their seats on the floor until Senate Democratic leaders called the Senate back into session. Senator Richard Russell of Georgia said the whole nation is shocked by this dastardly crime. And after a 15-minute recess, the Senate returned and had the Reverend Frederick Brown Harris, Senate chaplain, say a prayer. The Senate adjourned after the chaplain's prayer that President Kennedy's life might be spared. That, of course, was before word came that he had already died. Vice President Johnson's office says it has no information to confirm rumors that Johnson has been wounded in the shooting. That, however, was an earlier word, and evidently uh, the Vice President was not injured, according to all the information we have. 
Uh, we were told from Dallas a few minutes ago that the vice president is already uh, on his way back to Washington. Possibly he is uh, attempting to uh, get back to the airport. I doubt that he has had time to leave Dallas. In any event, according to the best information we have, Vice President uh, Johnson will not take the oath of office as president until he returns to Washington. On the seventh floor of the Hotel Commodore here in New York, where the Democratic State Committee has headquarters, about a dozen women, including members of the staff, broke into tears. All normal activity ceased in the hotel, and in nearby office buildings, they were crowded around radio and television sets, as I'm sure millions of persons are all over the country by this time. And incidentally, uh, you may have seen, of course, a good deal of confusion in our reports. Uh, quite naturally, all of us in the television and radio industry were taken quite by surprise by this event. Uh, obviously, no one could possibly in his wildest dream have imagined that such a thing would happen. Uh, the word came, of course, uh, that the shooting had taken place uh, during the normal lunchtime here in New York, and uh, all of us at all the networks uh, rushed back from uh, wherever we were at the time and uh, got on the air as quickly as possible. And we are still operating under more or less uh, emergency and impromptu conditions, but we are staying on the air to bring you the news, uh, every bit of information as it comes to us from the wire services and from our own reporters in Dallas and in Washington. We have just received word that Assistant Presidential Press Secretary Malcolm Kilduff confirms that Johnson, that is, Vice President Johnson, was not hit by the rifle fire. The new president previously had been reported wounded. So I think that uh, there is no doubt now that uh, Lyndon Johnson is all right. He was not injured in the shooting. Mayor Wagner in, uh, here in New York was uh, at a, uh, uh, a luncheon club when he received the news. He reported he was watching the news of the shooting on television, described the event as a terrible thing. We'll be receiving... Uh, various uh, comments by uh, dignitaries and others all over the country. The only thing, of course, that all of us can say at this time is that this was a shocking, shocking thing, something which no one could have imagined would happen, and yet it has. President Kennedy was the first president to be assassinated since William McKinley was shot, and that was in 1901, 62 years ago. And this is the first death of a president in office since Franklin D. Roosevelt died of a cerebral hemorrhage at Warm Springs, Georgia, in April 1945. There have been only, uh, I guess in this century, only three other presidents have been uh, shot at. Uh, besides McKinley, there was an attempt on the life of uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, in which Mayor Cermak of Chicago was killed. And there was an attempt on the life by a group of Puerto Rican nationalists in Washington on the life of uh, President Truman while he was staying in Blair House at the time that the, president, uh, that the uh, White House was uh, being rebuilt. That was in 1950. Two Puerto Rican nationalists tried to gun their way into Blair House and assassinate Mr. Truman, who was taking a, knack, a nap at the time on the second floor. One White House police officer was killed in that shooting and another seriously wounded. One of the assassins was killed in a blaze of gunfire on Pennsylvania Avenue uh, right across the street from uh, the White House. Guarding the president, of course, obviously is a very hazardous occupation. Uh, one of the Secret Service men with, uh, traveling with President Kennedy was killed by the gunfire today. We have not received word uh, that any others were wounded. Governor John Connolly of Texas underwent an operation for the gunshot wound. He was struck in the chest. He was operated on at 2.30 uh, p.m. today. His condition is said to be serious. It's not described as critical, but serious. The governor was not out of the woods, according to the doctors. They say that uh, his vital, uh, the vital signs are good, however. The doctor said Connolly, Governor Connolly had a good pulse. His respiration was satisfactory. According to eyewitnesses, Governor Connolly and President Kennedy fell simultaneously. We do not know, of course, at this time whether that indicates that they were both felled by the same bullet 
which was fired by a sniper, according to our reporters in Dallas. Someone saw uh, the muzzle of a gun emerge from a window in a warehouse building along the parade route, or not far from the parade route. Uh, we don't know how many shots were fired. Uh, there were more than one, possibly three or four. Do you have any uh, further information, uh, Ed Silverman? Have you received any? Uh, reports. We've got the phone open here, uh, Ron. We have the uh, expectancy of a report from uh, Bob Clark any moment. He, of course, was traveling with the presidential party. Uh, here's uh, something just in. It's a report out of Washington, of course, reporting that six members of President Kennedy's cabinet were out of the country flying to Japan when the president was killed uh, today. They were an hour and a half uh, out of Honolulu. The secretaries were advised of the killing, and of course, they immediately turned back. They're expected to speed directly back to Washington. Now, this party was on its uh, way to a meeting with members of the Japanese cabinet. Now, in the party en route were uh, Secretary of State Rusk, Secretary of Commerce Hodges, Secretary of Labor Wirtz, and Secretary of the Interior Udall, and Secretary Ag of Agriculture Freeman. Their wives accompanied them. Of course, when they heard the news, they turned directly back. I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that President Kennedy's administration is perhaps one of the most traveling administrations uh, of all time, uh, partly because of the availability of jet planes and therefore the relative ease of travel, but also because it was uh, part of the uh, pattern of uh, President Kennedy's uh, method of operating. He liked to travel. He liked to go to the, the scene uh, where things were happening and uh, to see and uh, hear for himself. And uh, partly because of the president's own inclinations in those directions, there was a great deal of traveling done by him and his staff, but also he surrounded himself with people who, uh, who seemed to like to travel. And uh, it is ironic that uh, this event should occur at a time when the White House staff, the official White House staff, was largely depleted uh, you heard earlier that Pierre Salinger, the president's news secretary, was on his way to Tokyo, and uh, many of the other uh, top-ranking officials of the White House were not at their desks, not even in Washington. So that uh, this did perhaps slow up uh, the uh, transmission of news, considering the president somewhat. We have word that the Russian news agency, TASS, carried a flash on its international English language radio teletype circuit at 2.45 p.m. today. The flash said it has just been officially announced that United States President John F. Kennedy has died in a hospital after an attempt was made on his life by persons as believed from among the extreme right-wing elements. The identity of the assassin or assassins, we do not know whether it's more than one person, uh, the identity has not been established. Sheriff's officers in Dallas took a young man into custody at the scene and questioned him behind closed doors, we're told. And uh, a Dallas television reporter said he saw a rifle being withdrawn from a window. You heard that on our broadcast here a few minutes ago. He said it was on the fifth or sixth floor of an office building shortly after the gunfire. Kennedy uh, was shot at 1.25 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. With me in the studio here is a man who spent eight years with, uh, as press secretary for President Eisenhower and uh, is uh, used to the precautions taken by, uh, for the president's safety. And uh, he is Jim Haggerty, now vice president of uh, ABC Paramount Pictures. Jim, uh, what uh, security measures would have been taken in this case? Well, Don, uh, whenever the president goes any place, uh, there is always an advance party of Secret Service uh, men that go out into the area. They work closely with the local municipal police, uh, with the sheriff's department in the county, and with the state police. Uh, they make the advance preparations. Yep. During a motorcade uh, where this uh, terrible thing happened, uh, there is always uh, the driver of the presidential right. car, is a member of the Secret Service. I'm sorry service. to interrupt, uh, Jim. We'll get back to this. Right. We have a phone call from Bob Clark in Dallas. Uh, back to uh, Ron Cochran. Stand by, please. Hey, Nick. Uh, Bob, uh, stand by, please. We were having a little technical difficulty. All right, Bob, yes, we are on the air now, Bob. Would you give us a recap of all that you know, please? 
Well, first, the president's body has just been taken to Parkland Memorial Hospital to a Dallas funeral home. The body in a sealed brown basket was wheeled out of the emergency ward where the president has been since uh, he was admitted to the hospital about an hour and a half ago. Mrs. Kennedy walked quietly by the side of the casket as it was placed in an ambulance waiting outside the hospital. Uh, Bob, there have been uh, reports that there was a possibility that Mrs. Kennedy and uh, Mrs. Conley might have been wounded. Any uh, thing no, to that report? None of the women in the uh, were wounded. There has been a still unconfirmed report that Lyndon Johnson suffered a heart attack uh, sometime after the shooting. Uh, the only thing I could add to this, I was at the side of the president's limousine when the president's body was lifted out of the car and uh, placed on a stretcher and taken into the emergency ward. At that uh, time, oddly, uh, the vice president uh, appeared to be clutching his chest. Uh, he preceded the president into the hospital, uh, which seemed an unusual thing to do. Normally, you would have expected that he would have stood uh, at the side of the president. So this might lend some credence to the reports that the vice president may have suffered a heart attack. Is he now en route to Washington? Uh, we understand he is on route to Washington. We have this further word from Mrs. Johnson, who left the hospital here about a half an hour ago, uh, said only one word when she was asked about the vice president, and that was that he was fine. Has anyone uh, seen Mrs. Kennedy uh, uh, recently? How is she taking it? Is she in a state of shock? Is she under sedation? She walked within a half dozen feet of me just three or four minutes ago as the uh, president's body was taken out of the hospital. Uh, she... I didn't get a clear look at her face. Obviously, she is grief-stricken at this stage, but she was walking calmly uh, on the by the side of the casket as it, as, it, as it was carried out of the hospital and placed in an ambulance. All right, Bob, just to recap this, would you give us the very latest that you have on the president and the situation there and uh, some of the reaction there, too? Uh, I know it's been quite a shock to all. Well, uh, actually, we have gotten little official words from the White House uh, we got the announcement, uh, something like a half an hour ago, uh, that the president was dead. There has still been no official uh, words from the doctors who were in attendance. It's known, of course, that the president was killed by one shot that struck him in the right temple. I can recap briefly the, the tragic chain of events. The presidential motorcade had just swept through downtown Dallas. Uh, the crowds couldn't have been friendlier, couldn't have been more cordial or more enthusiastic. Uh, uh, they were extremely large. Uh, uh, there must have been at least uh, uh, 150,000, uh, probably more than that, along the route of the motorcade from Love Airport in Dallas to downtown uh, uh, Dallas. The, we had just rounded the uh, a corner at the fringe of the business district when three shots suddenly rang out, but they uh, they sounded at this uh, uh, stage like an automobile backfiring. They were extremely loud. I was in a car at, uh, as a pool man for the uh, American Radio and Television Networks, was in a car, just three cars behind the president. We heard uh, the shots very clearly, but it was uh, almost inconceivable at that stage that this was uh, an assassination. Uh, about uh, no more than two or three seconds elapsed before the uh, the, the car that the president was traveling, this was uh, uh, an uh, open limousine that had been uh, sent out uh, from the White House fleet in Washington. Uh, this car came to an immediate stop, the Secret Service uh, follow car. Uh, some of the agents piled out, then almost immediately leaped back in. We saw uh, one of them pull out a, a, a submachine gun. They leaped back into the car and the uh, motorcade took off very rapidly. It had just entered a, a throughway. Uh, the motorcade uh, did something like 60 miles an hour uh, to Parkland Memorial Hospital, which is some three or four miles away. The car I was in uh, uh, kept up with the motorcade. Uh, we were some 50 feet behind the, the car carrying the president when he entered the hospital grounds. Uh, we, of course, all stepped out of the car and went immediately to the side of his car. At that point, uh, the president was uh, lying uh, prone in the back seat of the car, his head cradled by 
uh, Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, he was holding one hand over his head. Uh, apparently, he had, uh, when he had been shot, he had, uh, he had uh, clutched his, uh, his hand to his uh, face. Uh, he was absolutely motionless. Uh, uh, I think someone who had, uh, was more experienced uh, uh, at uh, this sort of uh, disaster might have recognized immediately that the president uh, uh, had been mortally wounded. Uh, I stood at the side of the car for some uh, oh, a minute or two while uh, a stretcher was wheeled out. During uh, this period, the president uh, made no motion at all. He, uh, the, the first lady, uh, again, sat rather holding his head. Then he was lifted uh, by uh, three or four Secret Service agents, again with um, Mrs. Kennedy uh, standing by, actually pulling on to him uh, during this period. He was lifted uh, by the agents and placed on the stretcher, wheeled immediately into the emergency ward of the hospital. At this point, Governor Connolly, who had uh, also, of course, been shot and is still in critical condition, uh, was lying sort of half stretched out in the front seat of this uh, the same open limousine. The only persons besides the Secret Service agents in the car with the president were Governor uh, Kenley, Governor Connolly, uh, and the uh, First Lady. Uh, the, when the president was wheeled into the hospital, Governor Connolly was still uh, playing, uh, again, half-stretched out on the front seat of the car. Uh, I, had, I was surprised at this stage. I had noticed while we were waiting for the stretcher to be wheeled up for um, Mr. Kenneth, the vice president, who had been traveling in a car behind the president, uh, had gotten out, and uh, with someone by his side, uh, the vice president appeared to be clutching his chest, he walked into the hospital, oh, uh, perhaps a minute or so, but before Mr. Kennedy was placed uh, toward the... There have since, of course, been unconfirmed reports that the vice president has suffered a heart attack. The, uh, from the time the president arrived uh, at the hospital, we went through almost an hour without uh, uh, any medical word at all. The, the corridor uh, where he had uh, uh, been wheeled into the emergency ward uh, was closed off uh, to all but the uh, Secret Service uh, agents. Uh, Senator Yarbrough of Texas, who had also been in the uh, uh, procession and in the car with uh, Lynn Johnson, uh, sat uh, weeping quietly in uh, a, a small hospital room off the corridor. The Secret Service maintained extremely strict uh, precautions uh, during this stage. No one, and that meant absolutely no, no one, was permitted down the corridor within 50 of the uh, emergency room where the president uh, then lay. The official word that uh, the president uh, was dead was, uh, this announcement was made in the lobby of the White House uh, almost an hour after he had been uh, shot. Uh, the only development since that time, and we have still had no further medical details from any of the doctors in attendance, the only further development came just a few minutes ago when the president, uh, the bronze casket uh, bearing the president's body was out of the hospital, put in, placed in, uh, in an ambulance and taken to a, a Dallas funeral home. All right, Bob, we're going to do something rather unorthodox, but the circumstances call for it. We want you to proceed to a radio station, TV station, WFAA, and uh, give us your reports from there. Call us on our number of suspects, 75,000, extension 385. Those are your instructions, Bob. Thank you very much for the report. Until we have somebody else here at the hospital, uh, okay, or someone else uh, uh, getting development, I would not do that at this stage. Okay, we'll abide by your decision, and Bob. You keep us posted. Anytime you have anything fresh, give us a call, and we'll put you on. Okay, fine. Thank okay, fine. Thank you. That was Bob Clark and Duff. TV you were just taking, huh? Next. You're on the air, Bob, so we hear you. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. Okay, fine, thanks. And uh, we'll hear from you later. That was Bob Clark in Dallas. Let's go now to, let's go now to Don Goddard. Uh, with me here in the studio is Jim Haggerty, who spent eight years as press secretary of President Eisenhower, as you know and who had a hand in the planning of many motorcades like this to prevent the very thing, the very greatest dread of the thing that has happened today. Jim is now vice president of ABC. Uh, Jim, uh, what precautions normally would be taken, and why did they break down in this case? Well, I don't think they broke down. Uh, there is always an advance Secret Service detail that goes to any city uh, and works with the local police, the sheriff's office, uh, the state police in uh, protecting the line of route. 
But when a president of the United States or any official of our country is traveling in an open car, you cannot guard every single window. You cannot guard every single building. So you have to go for a show of force, uh, an obvious show of police protection. In an open car or in any car that the president rides in, the driver is a Secret Service man and the man in the front seat is a Secret Service, a secret service man. Uh, immediately uh, following the presidential car, there is at least one and sometimes two follow-up Secret Service cars. Uh, the drivers of those cars are members of the Secret Service and uh, uh, the occupants are Secret Service and special assigned men from the municipal police force uh, or the state police force or the sheriff's office. Uh, I have seen many motorcades, talked to many officials of law enforcement agencies throughout our country and uh, around the world. And each of them say the same thing, uh, that uh, uh, a rifle shot, particularly from a window of a building, is pretty tough to guard against. Uh, but the President of the United States, a man in that office, uh, has to be completely uh, fatalist about his own welfare. And fearless. And, and fearless. And uh, all of our Presidents, I think, have uh, been that way. Uh, the very fact uh, that at least a suspect has been uh, seized uh, shows that the security was working to a certain point. Uh, but uh, this has happened, uh, attempts have happened before. Uh, and Ron Cochran has reported uh, the other events uh, uh, at, in front of Blair House in 1950 uh, with President Truman in Miami with President-elect uh, Roosevelt. But the thing that this one, a little different than any others, was that this was a rifle apparently used with a marksman. In the past, there only one other man outside of the Puerto Ricans who fired at a president that knew how to shoot a firearm was John Wilkes Booth. Uh, all of the other attempts on the lives of the presidents have by, been by screwballs who have fired a gun for the first time in their life at the president of the United States. Uh, Jim, uh, we now have some film, of fresh film in Dallas, uh, which, and we will go to our Dallas newsroom for that. Jay Watson and Bob Walker at WFAA-TV in Dallas, the ABC News Information Center for this area. The eyes of the nation and the hearts of the nation are with Mrs. Kennedy today, and the eyes of Dallas, Texas are held in shame. The, we have a film available that was, excuse me, Bob, go ahead. May report this bulletin that a Secret Service agent and a Dallas policeman were shot and killed here today. They were shot some distance from the area where President Kennedy was assassinated. No other information immediately available from there, except one more point here that uh, this uh, Secret Service Lieutenant Eric Kaminsky has said the assassin's weapon appears to have been a high-powered army or Japanese rifle of 25 caliber. The entire building where the sniper was located was evacuated. If we could get a picture of our map here and show somewhere of the building, it was a, te it's a Texas school, uh, school book depository, me, which means exactly what it says. This is the car where the president was. This is what we call our triple underpass in Dallas. This is the grassy area where, and it was originally thought that the shots came from in here, and now it's believed that the shots came from this building here. We have a film now, and by the way, we have the, the one of the men, someone, and I should say someone, has been arrested in one of the downtown theaters. Uh, they don't know if it was the uh, man who shot the policeman or the person who actually shot President Kennedy and Governor Conley. It's in our process. It's being processed now. We'll have that just as soon as possible. Right now, we have an interview with an investigating officer, so let's roll that film, please. Oh, no. You saw a man up there. That's where the guy was. Open my mic. 
This is the, of course you realize that the film is unedited and this is one of the parts of the film without the, the sound on it. This film was made in one of the investigators' offices here in Dallas and we will have the interview in just a few moments. I'd like to repeat that we will have some videotape later in the day of the president's arrival at Love Field in Dallas at approximately 11.35 this morning and one hour later the president was shot. Uh, this is filmed in Sheriff Bill Decker's office. Sheriff, Sheriff of Dallas County. The... Uh, the city of Dallas, well, I know... Here's sound. Yeah, can I have your name? Uh, J.H. Sawyer. In your position? Inspector, please. What is the story here now? This is apparently the building that the assassin shot from. This is the building that the witnesses said they had seen a man up there and some with a rifle. And also we found some uh, empty rifle shells on the fifth floor. So he would have been directly above us? Was directly above us. Indications were that he had been there for some time. Uh, well, has the police department taken any precautions uh, against such an incident? We thought we had taken all of the precautions that were necessary. But this particular building uh, was not covered, as were a lot of other buildings. So as it stands now, uh, there is a suspect. There were witnesses. There are witnesses who saw the man. What did they see as far as the president and the governor? Well, several of the witnesses saw him slump over. The president? Yes. And the governor? And the governor, yes. You also understand the Secret Service man was in? This I do not know. I haven't received that information. How many policemen are there in the city of Dallas? We have approximately 1,300. I would assume they're all out right now. Uh, uh, Yes, a bulletin here. Police have arrested a white man in the Riverside section of Fort Worth in connection with the shooting of a Dallas policeman. The man has denied any connection with the assassin, assassination of President Kennedy. Of course, there will be a lot of stories coming in like that. Everybody that's picked up here uh, will be in some way or another connected. We do not know at this moment in Dallas, uh, from the latest word we've gotten from our reporters, from the police chief, and from the sheriff's department if any of the people arrested so far are actually the person who pulled the trigger it seems like that the building the building that the shot was fired from is a building used by the state of texas to store school books uh... it's an old building a building that would be hard to cover it stands over the viaduct as the i, I guess there are fifteen or twenty different places throughout the building that someone could be yes. hiding to take a shot. I don't know of anything uh, I'd like to speak here for the city of Dallas. We are ashamed at the moment. We are stunned. The whole world is stunned, but at this moment I don't think anybody could be more stunned than the people who live in our city. We have uh, only a few weeks ago when Adelaide Stevenson was here, and you're all familiar with the incidents that took place there, and all of us were commenting this morning, and all of us for the last few days have been commenting that we hope nothing would happen to bring disgrace to Dallas. Uh, the messages are coming in to our newsroom from all over the state, coming in from all over the world. We will have, uh, how do we stand on our film, Bob? Have you been able to check? It's being developed now. The about, about six minutes. or eight minutes before we do have. In the meantime, let's show the videotape of the president arriving. That's why he's queuing down. Beg your pardon? Just one moment here. We're queuing. We have the videotape of the president arriving this morning, is that correct? Okay, we are now queuing up the videotape of the president's arrival in Dallas this morning, Bob. I couldn't help but uh, I was at the airport broadcasting the, uh, the arrival. Couldn't help but mention how thrilled the crowds were that the president broke away from his uh, normal routine and uh, and rushed up to the fences and shook hands with the hundreds of people estimate now somewhere between fifteen hundred and two thousand people at love field and i couldn't help but remark how, how great spirits he was in and his wife their texas reception thus far had been just wonderful uh... better than suspected in houston perhaps not quite as good in san antonio i think above all expectations in fort worth uh, this morning he had stepped out in the parking lot and talked to 8,000 people in Fort Worth and uh, his wife wasn't along. A few people were disappointed and the president uh, very jokingly remarked, well it takes Jackie a little longer to get prettied up than it does me. 
and that's where she is now, he told the crowd. Then he went inside and addressed the breakfast meeting over there at the Texas Hotel where they had spent the night, and then came on into Dallas. And uh, the Dallas reception was, was just tremendous at Love Field. The crowds are roaring and cheering and, and straining right. forward to get a good look uh, yeah. at the president. Uh, and then his, he and his wife broke away and came up smiling to the fences, walked all along that fence. And now let's see it. I think the videotape is ready of the president's arrival here this morning. There he is. He's uh, waving at a lot of people, smiling, secret service men all around. Boy, this is something. They break right away and come right up to the fence. And the people who waited all morning in this fence are rewarded with a glimpse, and a lot of them with a close look and a handshake for the President of the United States and his wife. And he's coming right down to, uh, toward us and toward our uh, fine camera positions here. The press is having a field day. Somebody perched up on somebody's shoulders. Secret Service right along with the President, of course. The president passes right in front of a Dallas police officer, right in front of our cameras now. Somebody patted his shoulder, Mrs. Kennedy coming along behind him, grinning all the while. The president saying, thank you very much, if I may be permitted to, to read a presidential lip movement. This is a bonus for the people who have waited out here. Now, Mrs. Kennedy, right along behind him, the president still moving uh, over towards some phone booths that were set up for the press, the people surging up toward that fence, but there is a fence, and the president waves goodbye, waits for his wife, and back they go to the car. Governor Connolly standing in the car, beaming. Uh, show quite distinctly the Secret Service coverage of the president. Uh, there are three or four Secret Service men right behind uh, the President and Mrs. Kennedy, as Mrs. Kennedy now gets into the car, and the President does. The other man in the car is the Governor uh, of Texas, uh, and the Secret Service men are now getting in uh, the driver and the front seat. Uh, the other members of the detail have apparently left to uh, go into the follow-up car, which is the car immediately, which will be the car immediately behind uh, the President's car, uh, in the motorcade. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy and the President, as you can see, are leaving. The Governor of Texas is in the jump seat right directly in front uh, of the President, and uh, the wife of the Governor of Texas is sitting in front of Mrs. Uh, Kennedy. The Secret Service uh, are following the car out. Uh, they're standing on the running board of the follow-up car, and as is their custom, until the President's car picks up uh, speed, usually about 20 miles an hour, run alongside of the car. Uh, when the car is moving, the Secret Service drop back, jump into the follow-up car, and stay right with him. The driver of the follow-up car keeps his car about no more than 10 feet at the uh, maximum and usually about 6 feet behind the presidential car at all times, regardless of the speed uh, of the president's car and the speed of the motorcade. Uh, the other cars that you see there, I would imagine uh, are cars for dignitaries uh, and cars for uh, um, the uh, press uh, corps that follows with the president. One of the cars in the motorcade is a pool car uh, of representatives uh, uh, of the combined news media. There again you can see the Secret Service in the follow-up car, uh, standing on the running board. That car, by the way, has uh, very heavy armaments uh, in it. Uh, it has uh, submachine guns. Uh, it has uh, uh, the necessary... And now, as you see, the president's car is leaving. I return you now to Dallas. A gentleman just walked in our studio that I am meeting for the first time as well as you. This is WFA TV in Dallas, Texas. May I have your name, please, sir? My name is Abraham Zapruder. Mr. Zapruder? Zapruder, yes, sir. Zapruder. And would you tell us your story, please, sir? 
I got out in, uh, about a half hour earlier and get into a good spot to shoot some pictures. And I found a spot, one of these uh, concrete blocks that I have down near that park near the underpass. And I got on top there, there was another girl from my office, she was right behind me. And as I was shooting, as the president was coming down from Houston Street making his turn, it was about halfway down there, I had a shot. And he uh, slumped to the side like this. Then I had another shot or two, I couldn't say what it was, one or two. And I saw his head practically open up, all blood and everything, and I kept on shooting. That's about all. I'm just sick again. I think that pretty well expresses the entire yeah. feelings of Terrible. the whole world. Terrible. You have the film in your camera. We'll try yes, to get, I brought it on the studio. Now. We'll try to get that processed and have it as soon as possible. Right now, we have videotape. Uh, a picture of the building of where the uh, bullet came from. Let's take the picture first, then the videotape. Oh, this is videotape now. This is a picture of the hearse leaving uh, Parkland Hospital with President Kennedy's body. As I understand it, uh, the body is being taken to one of the funeral homes here in Dallas. That, Bob, that pretty well covers it, I think. This is the same hospital that President Kennedy visited in his visit here in 1961. It is not? Excuse me. He went, this is the outside shot of the hospital and the people who are gathered there. All stunned in the realization that President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas today. Now we have a picture of the building... There is a picture of the building that one of the boys took showing uh, possibly one of the windows that the fire, that the uh, that was used the top right hand okay which one which one was it uh, let's see if we can figure it out there it is there is a picture of the window where the gun was uh, allegedly fired from that killed President must Kennedy have been in the line of fire today. Excuse me, go ahead, sir. I must have been the line of fire where I see now the picture where I was. I was right on that uh, concrete block, as I said. And as I explained before, I was a sickening scene. At first I thought perhaps it's a... Uh, it sounded like uh, somebody make a jokey here, uh, a shot and somebody grabs their stomach. I was about 100 yards away from... Uh, one of our other, the boy and I walked over to see President Kennedy. We were about 100 yards away, and it sounded like there were three shots. And after the first couple, I said, uh, uh, my God, uh, they shot the president. And then we walked over and looked down and could see the people on the grass there. And I imagine you were one of the people that we saw there was, uh, was, underneath uh, the viaduct. This, uh, uh, this happened this afternoon about, uh, what time, 12.35, the president died. Something, something like it. it was the president died involved. at one o'clock. They sounded like, uh, at first they sounded like firecrackers and somebody <clears throat> next to us said they're shooting off fireworks, but then we realized, uh, it didn't take but a minute to realize that they were uh, loud reports and for those of you who are familiar with hearing a rifle shot, it was uh, a recognizable sound. The videotape that we have, Bobby, what do you have now? Okay, the, that is, that completes the videotape coverage for the moment. We will have film back um, in about 15 minutes of the arrest of a person who could be the person who shot the policeman or the Secret Service man or Conley or President Kennedy, and we'll have that in just a moment. Now let's go back to ABC in New York. Uh, Jim, the uh, Dallas Sheriff's Department has found a rifle on the fifth floor staircase of that building we just saw in the picture the uh, st uh, book storage place. It's a 7.65 Mauser, German-made army rifle, telescopic sight, and one shell left in the chamber. Three spent shells have been found nearby, and apparently they're hooking this as the as the murder weapon. Uh, this is from one of those windows up in the top. Well, Don, uh, as I said a little earlier, I, I think this, like the Puerto Rican attempt 
uh, in Blair, in front of Blair House in 1950, uh, has to be a planned conspiracy. Uh, this is the first time in our history when a rifle has been used uh, uh, and fired at a president of the United States. From the photographs uh, of the building, uh, that carry uh, must have been uh, a couple of hundred yards. Uh, and uh, whoever fired it uh, must have been a man uh, that could handle a rifle mm -hmm. uh, with a telescopic sight. And I understand uh, they found uh, the rifle and had a telescopic sight on it. All of the other attempts, uh, both assassinations and attempts, outside of the Puerto Rican one, uh, was done with a pistol. And with the exception of John Wilkes Booth, uh, the uh, attempted uh, or the assassins of a president fired a revolver at the president for the first time they ever fired a gun. So that this, this must have been a, a very carefully planned, uh, terrible tragedy uh, and conspiracy. Uh, again, uh, talking about the security matters, uh, in a large city it is uh, impossible to guard every single window. Uh, in the years that I served with General Eisenhower, the only time I ever saw all windows guarded in a line of march was at Tehran, uh, when President Eisenhower went to visit uh, the Shah of Iran. And as you might remember, along about that time, uh, his life had been publicly threatened uh, by the members of uh, the communist conspiracy throughout the world. And they turned out their whole army, and every single window uh, on that line of march in the city uh, was guarded by uh, 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 either an army or, or a policeman. Uh, but that was the only time I've ever seen that. You felt pretty well covered that time. Well, you know. felt very well covered. But in a city, uh, it's impossible. You, uh, uh, in a city the size of Dallas or New York, you just can't, you can't guard every single window. Uh, but uh, it happened. Uh, and these are the risks that a president always takes. I, I'm sure that every single president, I know President Eisenhower personally, uh, uh, in the back of his mind, always realized that there was a chance where some vindictive person or a screwball or somebody like that would take a shot at him. Uh, it's uh, bootless, Jim, to talk about what might have happened, but uh, would that bubble have bounced bullets uh, if it had been closed? Uh, I can't speak with any authority on the bubble that is now used. Uh, I can with the bubble that was used by President Eisenhower, and that was not bulletproof. Uh, the bottom of the car that President Eisenhower used, and I would assume is the same with President Kennedy, is armor-plated. Yes. And that is for grenades that might be tossed, or, 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 or a mine, or, or something like that. But the bubble uh, on President Eisenhower's car was used to protect mainly from the elements, uh, rain uh, or, or drizzle, uh, so that uh, the people uh, could still see him uh, if it was raining or, or was drizzling. Well, this adds one to the case for conspiracy then, and the Dallas police are uh, apparently trying to add another. They've arrested a 24-year-old man, Lee Oswald, in connection with the slaying of the Dallas policeman, and presumably the slaying also of the uh, uh, Secret Service man in another part of Dallas, which happened just shortly before the president. Well, I was interested also, uh, uh, Don, in the reports from uh, Bob Clark, that after the shooting happened, uh, the president's car and the follow-up car immediately left in a hurry, left the scene. Uh, this, again, is uh, in line with security measures. And if anything happens, they get out of that, uh, that place fast in case there are other people in the crowd that are, uh, are, are ready. Yes. Uh, Jim, uh, Jules Bergman is down in Times Square for reaction there. We switch to Jules. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Still not receiving anything on the PL. Still not receiving anything on the PL. Uh, this is the uh, scene in Times Square as New Yorkers stand stunned. You can see the uh, um, sorrow on their faces, I think. There isn't... Uh, everyone is waiting to hear what's going to happen next. As if... Uh, which is an This is an No. How are we going to use this? Just like this. We'll switch it. Switch cards. What the? What are you doing, Moore? This one will be okay. Disgusting. Um. 
The uh, New York City Police Commissioner has ordered all policemen to work uh, from 8 o'clock this morning to be held in reserve to 8 o'clock at night to handle the crowds that we have just seen in Times Square. Uh, Luciafi is standing by in Paris with the reaction from that stunned nation. We uh, Two, will listen to one. It. The news of the assassination of the president has shocked all of France. Here in this Riviera city of Nice, where the leading UNR party is meeting in its national convention, the okay convention mood has given way to one of sorrow. Delegates are sincerely sad. For despite differences that have existed between our two countries, France has faith in President Kennedy. The words being heard now are terrible tragedy, awful, and the universal attitude is this touches not only the United States, but France and all of the free world. The news struck here in France with a kind of bitter irony. This assassination has been the specter that has been haunting France for years. Three times extremists have tried to take the life as it has solved the goal. Three times they failed. And the fatalists have been saying, what if they finally succeed one day? What will happen to our country? Who will be able to follow in the general's footsteps? That same tragic question is now being asked about the United States. Who will be able to follow in the footsteps of John F. Kennedy? General de Gaulle himself was reported to have been deeply saddened by the news. Despite the general's differences with Mr. Kennedy, the general had a deep and faith and respect in President Kennedy. Even when he cast this trust on the future intentions of the United States, he always made it clear that he was not speaking of John F. Kennedy, that the president would keep his word to defend the free world. In the streets of this Riviera city, in the streets of cities all over France, a kind of blue has settled the country. Uh, the late dispatch from Washington says that uh, the president's body will be brought to Washington this afternoon. And uh, Vice President Johnson is expected to be sworn in as President of the United States aboard an airliner before flying immediately back to the nation's capital. Governor John Connolly of Texas who was shot at the same time as President Kennedy, has undergone surgery for the wound in his chest. His condition is serious, but uh, he's believed to have a good chance of uh, recovery. And now back to Dallas for a late report from there. Jay Watson and Bob Walker, WFA-TV in Dallas. We have some late film. Uh, the, uh, also, we understand that uh, Vice President Lyndon Johnson will be sworn in in Dallas. Our video cruiser is on the way. We'll try to have that tape for you later, or at least we will have film coverage of that as soon as possible. Let's roll the film now, Bob, and see what it has. All right. This is some of the uh, motorcade as it ended its drive uh, just minutes before it rounded the turn at which the president was shot and killed. Some of the people on the streets. And I, uh, just about a minute, I'd say 45 seconds before the president was shot, I was standing right in here and uh, gave the president the applaud. He turned the corner. There's the president and Mrs. Kennedy just minutes before he was shot. Mr. Haggerty explained, too, that that dome... Uh, was not on, as you can see there. there now we're getting down, down. Right here is where it took place. Just as you saw... Now, here is the spot there. where the president was killed. This is the building which the shot was fired. In a minute, you'll see a policeman or someone crawling in the... Where is the window where the shot was fired from? Now you see policemen with guns, suspecting perhaps the man was still in the building. Come back to the man. Bits of chicken... Food particles were found in the building, indicated, indicating he had been there for some time. The weapon has been found. I do not have the exact make of it. They found it on the sixth floor of this building. I just learned that. A German Mauser, I believe, is what it was. That's out in front of the Depositor Texas School. Right, this is just, just minutes after the president was shot. The, uh, if you remember the picture there where the president turned left and the long shot, it was there that it Dallas happened. Dallas County Sheriff Bill Decker. Policeman with the guns trained. Have no idea at all what, uh, who these people may be. Evidently they're clearing the area is mm -hmm. all I can say. The 
President John F. Kennedy has now been dead an hour and 49 minutes. This is a scene where President Kennedy was shot this afternoon, Dallas, Texas, picking up one of the... the Just there, suspects, suspects. Uh, by the droves, of course, have been pulled off the streets. Now, the picture you see now is tracing the route of President Kennedy up Levin Avenue on Turtle Creek. Now we're coming into the main part of Dallas. There's City Hall. He turns left right on Houston Street and right there is where the president was shot the films that you have the just trademark up the top of the picture is where he was set to give an address at uh, at uh, one o'clock incidentally uh, the minute he expired and right there is where the president was shot the films that you have the just The trademark up the top of the picture is where he was set to give an address at, uh, at uh, one o'clock, incidentally, uh, the minute he expired. Okay, Bob, uh, I see that Ron Ryland is. Let him scoot in here and tell what he knows. I think he had the film, uh, shot the film of the man that was arrested. Sit down. This is Ron Ryland. Uh, we are, you can imagine the confusion that's going on in the city of Dallas today, not only in our newsroom, but in all the newsrooms. Uh, Ron, tell us what you know. Well, I've just come back from Oak Cliff on, at the Texas Theater on uh, West Jefferson Street. Let me explain that Oak Cliff is a part of Dallas. Yes, sir, it is. Uh, we joined a police motorcade that was dashing to the... Uh, Texas Theater where they had a report of a man coming in there that was armed. Just prior to that, a police officer had been shot in that area, had been shot with a 38 caliber automatic. We uh, went to the scene, about, I would say, 200 or more police officers went into the theater and found a man sitting in the second row uh, from the back uh, that was armed with a shotgun. The uh, crowd, uh, of course, I imagine, uh, connected this with the slaying of the president. Uh, yes, sir. Any man I think it is armed in Dallas today no. is a suspect at the moment. The uh, officers converged on this man, grabbed him up, and hustled him out of the theater, all the while he was protesting against the police brutality that uh, they were working him over in one thing and another. They dragged him out. The crowd proceeded to push the officers aside and try to get at the man, uh, screaming murder and all, and they do believe that it was almost a lynch mob. Ron, did you just shoot the film that we just looked at? Uh, I just got in, Mr. Watson. No, I haven't seen A.J. Lost. Right, why don't you bring him in? Let's let him. Let's, we'll run the film again and let A.J. talk about it. Excuse me. Go ahead. Right, Do you know what, exactly what kind of gun that uh, they found over at the, uh, the book? Yes, sir. They have uh, just found the weapon that they believe is the assassination weapon. It is an Argentine 6.5 Mauser that had a four-power scope on it. Also in this same area, they found a bag of chicken, they found uh, several bottles of soft drink, yeah. and in other words, the man had been planted there for some time. He could have been there for quite some time. Yes, sir, I assume that he'd been there for possibly overnight because he did have several things there to eat. Do you have, uh, excuse me, I've just received word that Lyndon Johnson has been sworn in as President of the United States. More background material on that in just a few moments from New York. I'll repeat, Lyndon Johnson is now President of the United States. He was sworn in just a few minutes ago at Love Field. Our boys are coming back to the studio here at WFAA-TV with that film, and we'll have it in just a few moments. Let's look at the film again, Ron, and you narrate it this time because you were there. Uh, this is the film we showed just a few minutes ago. Go ahead. Well, this is just prior to the parade. Everyone was sitting around having a good time. I do believe it was a, a very fervent welcome for President Kennedy. Everybody yeah. seemed to be enjoying it. And the president made a statement earlier how pleased that he was with the turnout and his reception in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Yeah, but yeah, I think that it, uh, everybody was just real happy. As the motorcade came down the street, the this crowd all times broke loose and dashed out, yeah. shook hands with him. This is Main Street. Everybody and just seemed to be enjoying it and having a good summertime outing. Right. Now, in just a few moments, you'll see almost the exact spot where the president was shot uh, right in 
this area on down the road. Yes, sir. This is a bookstore, a yeah. Texas bookstore, right where yeah. these officers are, is where the uh, man was supposed to have been on the sixth floor. This is where they found the rifle. Right. Was on the sixth floor behind a box, a bunch of boxes mm -hmm. stacked in behind them. The crowd gathered quickly. The officers descended on the area and tried to keep people back, but of course everybody swarmed in, and uh, I guess the roof just sort of fell in on Dallas at this moment. It has. Uh, we went in with the Secret Service officers. We covered every inch of the building from the roof to the basement, and finally they did discover this gun on the sixth floor. There was no sign of the man. About six or seven witnesses said that they had seen this man, but of course at a time like this everybody sees everyone, right. and right. it's hard to tell which is true and which is not. Uh, the Secret Service agents, the FBI officers, all guarded the doors, would not allow anyone in the building or out. Therefore, I do believe that you'll find that these are exclusive films. I think as far are. as there's, the building itself, this sheriff, is Sheriff Bill Decker, mm -hmm. Dallas County Sheriff. These mm -hmm. are officers, and as you notice, they're all armed with riot guns, shotguns, machine guns, everything possible in an attempt to apprehend this man. I do believe that uh, he'll never be taken alive. That you do believe that? Well, I don't think they'll allow him. I'm afraid this man at this point is uh, so disrupted, he may just uh, do away with himself, if anything else. That's the conversation we've had here. Mm -hmm. The crowd swarmed in and did not necessarily hamper operations or anything like that. But More suspects here, I guess, huh? They were all taken over to Bill Decker's office where they were interrogated. Anyone who had said that they had seen anything at all, no. whether it was actually with the shooting or leading up to it, people hanging out of windows, the sheriff took him over and started to interrogate them. One of our newsmen, Mal Crouch, uh, said that he saw the rifle come out the window. That's it from Dallas, Texas. For the moment, we will have more film, and we will have film of Vice President Lyndon Johnson being sworn in later in the day. Now let's go back to New York. Uh, Lyndon Johnson is now President of the United States. He succeeds uh, the President, President Kennedy, uh, who held him in high esteem and had his every confidence. The, uh, Mr. Johnson took the, President Johnson took the oath aboard the presidential plane at Dallas's Love Field, and he is now preparing to fly to Washington to take over the reins of the government. Former President Dwight D. Eisenhower today called the assassination of President Kennedy a despicable act. He is stunned. John Ralston is standing by in our Washington studios with Washington reaction and more of the story of what will happen next. So we take you now to Washington. The nation's capital has learned of the president's death in stunned disbelief. Outside ABC studios, the sidewalk has been jammed with crowds following developments with shock and bewilderment on loudspeakers and TV screens. One can see the tragic news spreading from mouth to mouth on the streets. Here and there, people are crying. And there are reactions of rage and fury. At the White House, some of the staff was on hand as usual, though some were with the president. One office here was a quick direct channel of the news to Washington officialdom. That was Senator Hubert Humphrey, who rushed to the White House after Congress was informed by way of the staff's direct communication system with Dallas, a system that follows the president wherever he goes. Crowds gathered here, too, and saw the lowering of the White House flag to half-mast when the death of the president was confirmed. This is the Justice Department, crowds outside the offices of Attorney General Kennedy, the President's brother and closest advisor. President Kennedy's other brother, Ted, the senator from Massachusetts, happened to be presiding over the Senate when the first shocking word was whispered to him by a doorkeeper. Senator Kennedy immediately left the building and went to a waiting car. This is John Rolfson, ABC Washington. For other developments, here is Edward P. Morgan. Even in grief, the government has to get on with its business. For many minutes this afternoon, there was nobody actually at the helm of this great republic. The president lay dead of an assassin's bullet. The vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, was incommunicado in a hospital suffering from shock. But now, just moments ago, Lyndon B. Johnson has been sworn in as the president of the United States. What is the position that he occupied in terms of his relationship with John F. Kennedy before this act today? It just happens by the fortunes of coincidence and circumstance that this reporter was having lunch this afternoon at the Chilean embassy when ABC News called to tell me the news from Dallas. At that lunch was Hubert Humphrey, the whip 
the Democratic whip of the U.S. Senate, and Ralph Dungan, one of the chief aides of the president at the White House. I asked Dungan what the relationship actually was between Johnson and Kennedy. Had there been a scintilla of evidence uh, that the president was thinking of, quote, dumping, unquote, Johnson from the ticket in 1964? There had been speculation about this because Johnson's utility in 1960 was to carry as much of the South as possible, and now it seemed that a great deal of the South was going to leave Kennedy on the civil rights issue anyway. Dungan replied firmly that there was not a scintilla of evidence. I asked him how well informed the vice president had been in terms of top-level affairs in the White House and in the administration generally, and his answer was excellent. As a matter of fact, Lyndon B. Johnson, who had a massive heart attack, you may remember, in the summer of 1957 and was not expected to live, has recovered monumentally from that accident, that physical accident, and has been going at top speed ever since. Ironically enough, paradoxically enough, he has not been out of the United States to speak of, except for a brief time in the Navy during World War II, until he became vice president. As vice president, he has traveled as much, if not more, than Richard Nixon traveled for President Eisenhower. He has just come back from the Low Countries, that is to say, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Holland, on an official mission uh, for the president, and earlier he was in Scandinavia. Washington now is stunned and grieving, but the gears are already moving for the presidency of Lyndon B. Johnson. This is Edward P. Morgan in Washington. We have canceled all of our regularly scheduled programs for the rest of this day, and we will remain on the air until at least 11 p.m. tonight and perhaps later. Mourning, grieving with the country, with our countrymen, and bringing them all of the news that there is to be had in this melancholy day. Uh, Jules Bergman is waiting in Times Square with reaction there. We go to Jules Bergman. This is Jules Bergman reporting from Times Square from 44th Street and Broadway in the heart of New York. There is shock and indignation and most of all sadness at the death of President Kennedy here in the heart of Manhattan. A crowd of hundreds has gathered, still unbelieving, still not quite fully able to comprehend exactly what has happened. But there is sadness on their faces and there is disbelief. The flags here in Times Square have been lowered to half-mast. New York's theaters have announced their opposed tonight. There'll be no performances as long as the president lies in state. And even us, we too suffer from the shock. With us in this crowd, a GI back from Germany on leave. What's your name, soldier? Vincent Bokikio. How has this shock hit you? Real bad. What do you feel about it? Uh, it tightens up inside. He, he was a good man for the services. I liked him a lot. When he voted, if he ran again, I would vote him again. And a lady here waiting this past hour as the crowd is gathered here, listening to headlines, listening to radio news on the story. What is your feeling about it, ma'am? I was for Kennedy, and I was going to vote for him. And I was for him. I just can keep him crying. I really like him. Do you I'm believe it? Is, do you believe it has really happened? Well, it was told to me so nonchalantly that I almost fell off my chair at work. It just spread through the office first there. And they let it down. What about you, sir? What is your reaction? Uh, I was quite shocked. I think the world has lost its greatest leader. And uh, I just can't believe that anybody could be as miserable as that to do what they did to our great president. Do you feel the people will go on? The nation will not lose its impetus? No, we'll just carry right on. We're a great nation. And we'll, we'll recover. It's a great loss. What about you, son? You've well, been here, watch this happen. Right, right now I'm more, I'm more concerned about the country and the people and what their reaction is going to be. And I think that each of us are going to have to think about more the responsibility that the President Kennedy used to talk about so that something like this can't happen together. And that maybe we can hang together now at a time when we're really going to have to be together. Now when the country needs this responsibility. That the President Kennedy has talked about. I think, uh, sir? Go ahead, go right ahead. I, I think that it's more, more important now to think about 
America and about responsibility, about being in the home and comforting those who are close to you and ringing on your neighbor's bell and comforting your neighbor and talking to the person next to you, comforting him and having him comfort you so that if need be, you'll be able to assume and accomplish what you'll have to you know, at this as if, time. As if you lost a friend or a relative? No, it's as if we've lost somebody who has assumed the responsibility that we should have assumed all along, and now we're going to have to pick up where he left off, where he had to leave off. What's your feeling, sir? You've been sitting here. This is the most dastardly act against mankind that I can remember. The assassination of our great president. And so, shock. Here's another man. What is, what is your feeling, sir? My feeling is after 42 years recent retirement from the government in Washington, D.C., although a Republican, I think government workers have lost one of the best friends he has ever had for the benefit of better working conditions for all people. And I sincerely hope that whoever did it, you'll bring him to justice so quickly, because he was a great man, a good man, and he believed after I have spent 42 years just recently retired, he was a friend of all people, regardless of race, creed, color, religion, or national origin. And I'm deeply from South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. A personal loss is the only way we can describe our feelings, and this crowd of hundreds, this man swarm that is the heart of New York, can describe its feelings. This is Jules Bergman reporting from Times Square. Lyndon Baines Johnson was sworn in as President of the United States today aboard the presidential airplane and immediately took off from Dallas for Washington. And with him were Mrs. Johnson and the grieving Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. They are going to Washington with the President. The grieving uh, family of the Kennedys are assembling at Hyannisport to be with their mother and their father. Uh, Senator Edward Kennedy was presiding over the Senate chamber when he was informed that his brother had been shot, and he and his sister Eunice Shriver have flown now to Hyannis Court to be with M former Ambassador Joseph Kennedy and Mrs. Rose Kennedy. We take you now to the heartland of America and the reaction in Chicago. The scene here on Chicago State Street this gloomy, rainy afternoon is much the same as in any American city. Groups of people gathered about wherever a television set is displayed. They now know the news. They know the president is dead. They know that Vice President Johnson has become President Johnson. This was always a Kennedy town. Whenever Mr. Kennedy came to Chicago, as he did a few times since entering the White House, he was greeted by huge throngs. People would wait along the lines from O'Hare Airport to the center of the city for hours just to catch a passing glimpse of him. There was never any doubt about how the election would go in 1960. Everybody knew that Chicago was a Kennedy town. And the reaction of the people here today, is, well, they're just numb. Disbelief, all those trite phrases that come to mind, they apply here. Here's a young man in the crowd who's been standing here watching the ABC report of the sad events. Did you ever see the president? Yes, sir. When? In the political campaign of 1960. I was one of the workers for him. Saw him right before a huge torchlight parade that we had a, about a month before the election. And he shook my hand and asked me a, uh, about all I could tell him what was my name. He asked me a few questions. I was just kind of in awe of being near such a great person. And all I remember him saying then was, keep up the good work. And he congratulated not only me, or told not only me to keep up the work, but the whole party system and all the young people in particular. In what are your Chicago. thoughts now, young man, as you know that your president is dead? Well, I feel it's a terrible thing, it's, but it's something we're going to have to live with. And I don't think we should fly off the handle and start blaming groups either to the extreme right or the extreme left. It's something that happened. The killer should be brought to justice, but I don't think it was any particular well, group. And, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am? What's your reaction now that you know that President Kennedy is dead? I think it's a great loss to the country and the whole world. President Kennedy was a good man. I think it's a great loss. Did you ever see the president when he came here? No, I've never seen the president. But as a mother and as a wife, I can understand the grief of his family and to the world. It's a terrible loss. 
You're thinking now of Mrs. Kennedy? Yes, I'm thinking of Mrs. Kennedy, his mother and his wife. Yes. Well, that's about it. Here's a little girl. Do you know that the president is dead? Yes. You ever see the president? No, I haven't. You've studied about him in school, though, yes. haven't you? What are your thoughts, honey? Oh, well, I thought that was a terrible disgrace that the president is dead, and I'm, I feel very sorry for his wife, and I don't know what else to say. Well, that's about all there is to say. Crowd gathered here, just standing around, trying to let this, trying to absorb this awful news. This is Frank Reynolds on State Street in Chicago. Now back to New York. Well, that was Frank Reynolds in Chicago. Uh, incidentally, President Johnson is uh, the eighth vice president of the United States to assume the presidency through the death of a president. And there's a strange and uh, ironic uh, parallel between his position today and uh, that of Andrew Johnson, who was a man from a southern state who took over when uh, President Lincoln was assassinated. Uh, Johnson attempted then to calm down the country from its, uh, to heal the country's racial differences. Uh, Dallas is standing by for us. We take you now to Dallas. This is Dallas, Texas. The gentleman here again is Ron Ryland, one of our cameramen that have some, we have some exclusive fl film to show you once again. Uh, let's roll the film and we'll narrate it as we go. Ron, these are the police cars pulling into the right. area. Right. Uh, once the report went out that this man was holed up in Oak Cliff, we all went out in the motorcade. This is the first building that he was reported in. It's an old uh, junk shop of one kind or another. This is the jacket that the man was wearing. He discarded it as he ran down the street. An eyewitness here uh, said that he had seen the man go into the building, and this is the rear of it. The officers converged on it once again. Let's make a point here now. This is the, the film It is a suspect. This is a suspect, right. yes. They saw this man running in and out that answered the description no, of the original man. No, this is an eyewitness, Jay. The man that is being interrogated here said he saw the man run down the street. Of course, everywhere we went, the crowds converged and hampered Certainly. operations quite a bit. This is the scene where the police officer was shot. The car that you see in the background there belonged to the police officer, and this woman said that she had seen a man answering the description of the man that was later captured run up, stop the officer, and then shoot him. The, uh, about that time, another report came in that there was a man had walked into the Texas theater further down the block with a shotgun over his arm. Of course, everybody broke and ran down into the area at the time. Uh, this uh, gun that you see in the background here in this officer's hand is the one that allegedly was used to shoot the police officer. This is the officer's billfold that was found lying on the ground right alongside of the car. The crime investigators here are fingerprinting the car in hopes that they could possibly lift a print to use. Now we're inside of the Texas Theater. Of course, everything is black. The uh, movie is going on. Police suddenly jumped this man and started to drag him out of the theater, hustled him out to the car as the crowd broke and started to maul the police officers and grab this man, trying to run with him. They shouted murder and just almost anything to try and get at this man. As you see here, the officers... Uh, hustled him into the car and ran away just as fast as they could from this Texas theater in hopes of protecting this man. Uh, and they have taken him off to an unknown spot. We don't know where they're holding him uh, for the interrogation. Once again, these are exclusive films. We were the only photographers at the scene, Mr. Watson. The name of the officer slain was J.D. Tipton. This information, Police Captain Pat Ganaway today said a suspect held in the assassination of the picture you just saw here was an employee of the building where a rifle was found. Ganaway also said the suspect had visited Russia and was married to a Russian. This is, was the, this is not immediately confirmed. The suspect's citizenship is not known. Ganaway said the suspect was the same man who shot and killed a city policeman in the Oak Cliff section of the city. And if so, those are the pictures we just saw, correct? We sure hope so. All right. Uh, the, uh, the city of Dallas is in shock. We will have pictures and comments from our citizens in just a few moments. If I may interject a point here, we do have pictures upcoming of the gun that actually shot the president and things like that. They'll be along shortly. Okay, we'll have that in just a few moments here on ABC from WFAA-TV in Dallas. 
I haven't been out. I haven't been outside of the building since about 10 minutes after this tragic event happened in the city of Dallas. Uh, I have talked to the newsmen, and they say the whole, the, the entire city is in the entire nation is stunned and shocked. People are walking around the street in whispers and things like that. They don't talk loud. There's no screaming or hollering as you normally find in a city. Everybody is just absolutely stunned, as you pointed out. Well, it happened in our city, yeah. and this is a shock that I imagine will live forever in our hearts. I can only compare this to the time uh, when uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt passed away and the shock that came over everyone. Uh, this is the way the city of Dallas is today. People are walking the streets. No one is doing any work. Everyone is sitting and talking and wondering how in the world it could happen in the city of Dallas. How could it happen here? And probably a better question than that is why did it happen in the city of Dallas? We will stay with the coverage, and under, I understand that ABC has canceled all their programming. Of course, we have canceled our local programming. We will stay with the story throughout the day. We are in the process now of developing a complete resume and wrap-up from the time President Kennedy landed at Carswell Air Force Base last night until the present. We will have a complete resume and pictures of everything that has happened. Uh, that's it from here. Thank you, Ron. Now back to ABC in New York. Uh, with me is Bob Young of ABC's News staff. Uh, Bob, uh, would you bring us up to date? On the Don, I've just returned from Wall Street, where, as you may have heard, the trading there stopped at 2.07 this afternoon. It's not clear whether the market will open uh, tomorrow on time or not, and the tape was running 34 minutes late when I was down there. There was much grief, much grief in Wall Street today. I talked to a man, an older man, a man from another country who literally broke down in tears before my eyes when this news came to him. <laughs> Members of the Kennedy family, as you probably know, are gathering at the home of the president's family in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. The president's children, John and Caroline, are at the White House. It's not known whether they have been told of the loss of their father as yet. The nation remains stunned. American, many Americans have wept. Many are angry, too. Former President Eisenhower said that he was shocked, dismayed, grieved. Mayor Wagner in New York held a press conference not long ago in which he said that President Kennedy has joined the line of martyrs. Mayor Wagner is a Catholic as President Kennedy was himself. The a late word here has it that Andrews Air Force Base officials said today that the president's body would be, uh, would, would be returned to Washington from Dallas at 6.05 Eastern Time tonight. Don? There was a terrible, cruel irony in today, uh, today's uh, tragic happenings, besides the tragedy itself. President Kennedy had been particularly happy on this trip because beside him was his beloved wife, Jacqueline. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy had been prevented, you remember, from being with the president on any major speaking tour since the primary campaign that preceded uh, his nomination in 1960 as the Democratic candidate for president. During the actual presidential election, Mrs. Kennedy was expecting her second child, John Jr., and in more recent months she had curtailed her public activities following the death of their newly born son, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. And again, with cruel irony, the president and his wife had received a heartwarming welcome from those Texas crowds. A Lyndon Baines Johnson, who fought off a near-fatal heart attack at 47 and went to work, he went on to, to work, he got back in it with both feet, and he faces his greatest challenge today, of course. President Johnson is one of the most powerful political figures in Washington, of course. Uh, just how uh, his political uh, leverage has survived remains to be seen. But again, he is a man who commands respect throughout the country and in the Congress. Of course, many folks thought that Johnson would have to slow down considerably when he became vice president. That's normally just a ceremonial job, although it's become, been more active in recent years. But he took so many duties on his shoulders that he needed three offices for his operations down there in Washington. And Edward P. Morgan is uh, ready in Washington. We switch you now to ABC Studios in Washington. President Kennedy ran more risks than most chief executives of the United States. His epitaph, as a matter of fact, ironically enough, 
might be called the title that he used for a book of his own, Profile in Courage. I was at the Berlin Wall with him early this summer when the dangers to him seemed to be very high. He took everything completely in stride. This afternoon, uh, after we heard the news, I asked one of his close associates in the White House if the president had ever discussed the possibility of danger to him. He said as far as he knew, he never had, and as far as he knew, and it was his own experience, that he did not have a fearful bone in his body. The orientation in Washington inexorably now has to be toward the Johnson administration. At this moment, only a matter of quarter hours, not much more, after the death of John F. Kennedy, one has to make the hunching guess that the rather moribund atmosphere and tempo of Congress will be quickened now in terms of dealing with the Kennedy New Frontier program of legislation. Lyndon Johnson was extremely aware of the must list topped by the tax cut and civil rights and with his own peculiar facility with dealing with Congress, he was majority leader of the Senate, you remember, during the Eisenhower years, he may well have a more forceful impetus and impact on the Congress than President Kennedy himself did. As a matter of fact, in terms of what criticism of the President there was, it usually fell uh, on the point that he was not as strong in his insistence with Congress as he might have been given his own popularity and the prestige of his office. ABC uh, News has canceled all its regularly scheduled programs for the rest of the day and will be remain on the air until at least 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, tonight. The Dallas Sheriff's Department said the rifle had been found in a staircase on the fifth floor of a building near the scene of the assassination. It was a 7.65 Mauser. The German-made army rifle had a telescopic sight with one shell left in the chamber. Three spent shells were found nearby. We would like to be able at this time to bring you up to date on Governor Conley's condition at the hospital, but it's off. We have not, as of now, been able to get any word from there. Our crew is standing by. We have our remote cruiser there, and as soon as anything happens, that will be on the air as soon as some word comes out exactly uh, the condition of Governor Conley. We have a piece of film we would like to show you now. Bert Ship is our chief photographer and assistant news director of WFAA television. This is... Uh, well, roll the film, Bird, and if you would narrate it, please, so they can move up there a little bit. All right, Jay, this is that uh, rifle that was shown minutes ago on the network. Uh, they dusted it for fingerprints from the, uh, while it was still up in the building. And uh, you'll see the Robert. detectives gathering and uh, getting their evidence. Uh, Tom Allier, one of our reporters and photographers, shot this film. He has just now managed to get out of the building because of the close security around it. You'll see stacks and stacks of books at this uh, right, get it up this there. big, uh, get it up there. many, many story building. And uh, there, the Bob, fella, they can't. actually found some chicken bones in there. We'll see a picture of that in a minute. Now the film starts getting a little bad. Looks like Tom lost his loop. But uh, this is uh, the inside of the building where the sniper was. There's the detectives. Uh, they get it all downstairs now trying to regroup after being stunned by this. There's one of the lights, the policeman that had some hard times. They're combing the building thoroughly. Dusting everything. Like I say, we have, this is the first time we've even seen the film. Fella had a soft drink while he waited for the president to drive. No telling how long he was there, Hubbard. Huh, no, there isn't. He had lunch there. <clears throat> they know that. Chicken bone, soft drink bottle. And that's that's about it, Jay. I'm sorry I don't know any more about it, but like I say, our man's on his way in. We had about uh, eight or ten photographers out around the city, and these boys. I understand we have some more coming up here. Oh, yeah. Well, this is uh, a shot from inside the building.
This building, this film was thrown out one of the windows. The, the building is closed up. No one can come in or leave the building. And this was tossed out the window and developed in the last 10 or 15 minutes here and on the air. Also standing by, coming in the front door now here, uh, we'll be on the air in just a moment or some interviews with the people in Dallas and their reaction to this tragic thing that happened just a few minutes ago or just a very short time ago. The uh, president seemed in a wonderful mood. His speech this morning, it was at 9 o'clock in Fort Worth, he was given a cab, the, the Texas hat, and you know which one that is, the wide hat, a pair of cowboy boots. Mrs. Kennedy was given a pair of cowboy boots. He stood out in front of the Texas Hotel in Fort Worth, talked to seven or 8,000 people, and in his usual manner, always went over and shook hands with the people. He arrived at Love Field at approximately 11.35 to 11.40 this morning in a great mood and once again moved over to the fence where he was not supposed to be this is moved into the procession yeah. downtown and at 1235 fatally shot and died at one o'clock there are a great many reactions in Dallas now the main thing that we're concerned with is the condition of Governor Connolly we will have that word for you just as soon as possible. As we understand it, there is no word coming out of the hospital. There is no way that we can get any information for you. It'll be about 15 minutes, Jay. Our cruiser is at the hospital entrance, and, and Conley's doctor will come out in about 15 minutes to make a statement, give a report, and a condition on, on the government. Very good. That's the, that's the latest word, that uh, in 10 or 15 minutes we will, have, we will have word for you. Right now... Here is a picture of the man who allegedly shot the policeman. We'll have a statement from the hospital in 15 minutes from the hospital. Things on the line. This is the gentleman who allegedly shot the policeman. And a few moments ago on ABC, you saw the films of him being arrested, exclusive films here on ABC. We're all asking ourselves the question, why Dallas, Texas? What happened? Who could have possibly been so dearranged to commit such a crime? We are stunned. The people of our city are completely stunned. There is no work going on. Our city is as a, at a standstill as you have seen around the country on ABC. The entire nation is presently at a standstill. Jay, I have something to read here. It's a statement from the Dallas Citizens Council, the Dallas Assembly and the Science Research Center, which sponsored his visit here today. Our hearts are filled with sorrow, as are those of every citizen of the United States, at the tragic and untimely death of President John F. Kennedy and the serious wounds suffered by the governor of our state. We are deeply distressed and grieved at the respectful and enthusiastic welcome in progress for our president was terminated by an act of lunacy. And it's signed by Mr. J. E. Johnson, President Dallas Citizens Council, Mr. W. Dawson Sterling, President Dallas Assembly, Dr. Lloyd Berkner, President Science Research Center. Charles Breed, a 38-year-old Dallas man, was standing in the crowd <coughs> was standing in the crowd at curbside about 15 feet away when the president's car approached. He gave his version. Mr. Kennedy was waving, and the first shot hit him, and that awful look crossed his face. The president's body was carried from the hospital in a bronze casket, and we have a picture of that for you now. Here is a picture of the body being removed. It was accompanied by Mrs. Kennedy. It was placed in a white hearse, and the drapes were pulled. White House Secretary Malcolm Kilduff said the body will be flown to Washington. It's on its way now, as I understand. White House officials stood sorrowfully looking stunned in corridors and in the waiting rooms. For almost an hour, rumors flew around the hospital where the president was alive or not. At 1.55, a priest said that he was still living. Then came the official announcement that John Fitzgerald Kennedy, 35th president of the United States, was dead. Blood was wiped from the presidential limousine as it was parked outside the hospital's emergency entrance, and a yellow group of flowers presented to Mrs. Kennedy Airport lay on the floor in the back of the car. We have some videotape now that we'd like to roll for you that Bob and I will narrate. We are not exactly sure what it is. It just arrived. It's threaded up on the machine. So let's roll the tape and see what we have. Okay, stand by. 
This is Ed Hogan of WFAA TV. We are at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, with the mobile cruiser of WFAA TV. The picture on your screen now, the flag of Parkland Hospital at half mast. Uh, the ambulances uh, possibly bringing in injured here at uh, their usual uh, day's work at Parkland Hospital. Panning now around, you can see the grounds of the hospital. Uh, a moment ago, uh, 30 or 40 gentlemen, probably of the press, uh, boarded a bus just to the left uh, of right where you, uh, the camera is following right now and boarded this uh, special chartered bus. We imagine they are the uh, press writers who were here for the uh, parade and luncheon and uh, all of the festivities that have suddenly turned into this terrible turmoil upon the death of our president, Kennedy. The people standing here, lining the walks and the driveways of Parkland Hospital, are stunned, just as all of us are, beyond belief. But it's unbelievable that the president of the United States is dead. Here's a shot of the outside of the hospital, and in just a few moments we will have some interviews of the people of Dallas. This word regarding Governor Conley. The governor's office said doctors have opened John Conley's chest and found several broken ribs and a bruised lung. They said the lung was collapsed by the bullet, but had been reinflated. Doctors report no serious artery damage to the governor's heart. He'll be in the operating room till about 4.30 p.m. at Central Standard Time and then will undergo surgery for his leg wound. Conley's pulse and blood pressure reported all right at 2.30 p.m. Now we will have a report, a further report in just a few minutes as soon as we can, as soon as it is made from the hospital. The uh, Governor Conley is the first I have heard that he uh, uh, had a, I knew that he was shot in the stomach, but I did not know that he had a wound in the leg. I know uh, we were standing, I was standing about a hundred yards from where it happened facing the other way. I distinctly remember three blasts of the gun, I, but it, there, there might have been two blasts at one time, you know, so you could only hear three, but I know there were three reports. This is Ed Hogan of WFAA Television in Dallas, Texas. We are standing on the grounds of Parkland Hospital where President Kennedy was brought just uh, a few hours ago and has died, as most of you have already uh, already know. We want to uh, possibly talk to some of the people here who are standing. What is your name, please? Uh, Mrs. Quincy Adams. Mrs. Quincy, are you from Dallas, Ms. Adams? Yes. How does this affect you? Uh, well, it's just a complete shock, and I think it's just it means a doom for our country. Well, it's, uh, it's a terrible thing, and it's shaken up and uh, shocked everybody. Well, it, it has, and I think Dallas will never get over this. Thank you very much. Uh, may I speak with uh, you, please? Uh, I'm Ed Hogan of WFAA TV. If you turn around around this, what is your name, please? Uh, Mrs. Schofield. And Mrs. Schofield, uh, how do you feel on this? I'm pretty terrible about it. We're from Loveland, Colorado. We're just down here for today. Just got down. Oh, you are. I have a daughter are, bad sick. Here. It all broke up over a, a hit and run accident the other day. Well, I'm off. Hospital. That's what we're trying to get in now to see her. Well, I'm off. Well, I just feel terrible about this. I just think it's one of the most terrible things that's ever happened. It certainly is that, and thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, may I ask your name, please? I see, you, I see you're wearing a banner, uh, Lanny. Colts, I wonder if you have a football game tonight. Yes, sir. I would imagine. What school do you go to? Uh, Cary. To Cary School Edward here Cary. in Dallas? Yes, sir. How do you feel? What is your reaction to this terrible thing that has happened to our president? Well, I just can't see why anybody would want to uh, shoot Mr. Kennedy for all the things he's done for us and tried to keep us from getting into war and everything. I see. And who is this with you here? Uh, Don, Don Myers. What's your name? Don Myers. Don, how, how do you feel on this terrible day? I just think it's just a shame because, I mean, I don't know why anybody would want to kill him. Thank you very much for speaking with us. We might get over here. What is your name, please? Gary Verts. Gary Verts. Uh-huh. And Gary, are you from Dallas? Yes, I am. 
How do you feel? What is your reaction to this terrible thing that has happened? Well, uh, it's a bad thing that's happened. I think it shouldn't happen here, really, because it's going to give this place a real bad name. Thank you very much. I believe uh, right now this is about all the people that we have here within the proximity of our length of cord on the microphone, but we will repeat that we're standing on the grounds of uh, Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas, where just a few hours ago the President of the United States was brought, his body was brought here after an assassin's bullet, a sniper, took away his life at a very early age of 45 years. This is Ed Hogan, WFAA-TV in Dallas. We're awaiting the arrival of Dr. Robert Shaw, the attending surgeon of Governor Conley, who will give us in just a few moments the latest on the condition of Governor Conley. He's about to make his entrance here in the press room on the main floor of Parkland Memorial Hospital. An earlier press conference that was held, uh, uh, Dr. Shaw described <laughs> Uh, the uh, condition and now to uh, we will immediately in just a few moments hear the latest on the condition uh, further word for you on Governor Connolly's condition I've just talked with uh, Dr. Shaw who visited with you earlier the governor is just finishing up in the operating room. He has been in there since 1.30, which means he will have almost four hours in the operating room. He is continuing in a satisfactory condition. The doctor is pleased. He says all damage has been arrested at this point, and at this point we need only await supporting care. He will be moved in just a few minutes to the recovery room. A room just adjacent to him already has been set up for Mrs. Conley, who will remain there overnight and indefinitely. The governor uh, has a cast on his wrist, or will have. It is now in process of being applied. Yes, sir. Is he conscious now? He is regaining consciousness at this time. What kind of bullet was it? I do not know. They're asking what type of bullet it was. Uh, Julian Reed with uh, Governor Conley. Has arrived a large portion of the Conley family. His mother, Mrs. J.B. Conley, is present along with brothers Merrill, Stamford, Wayne, and Godfrey Conley. Godfrey, G O L. F-R-E-Y. Merrill, M-E-R-R-I-L-L. -L. Stamford, S-T-A-M-F-O-R-D. M. Wayne. Godfrey. Sister Blanche. Godfrey, G-O-L-F-R-E-Y. Sister Blanche, who lives here in Dallas and son Johnny. That's his oldest son. That's Mrs. Blanche Klein. K-L-I-N-E. Yes, sir. E on Klein. Johnny's his oldest son. Johnny is his oldest son. The other two children, Sharon and Mark, are remaining for the time being at the mansion in Austin. They possibly will join him later in the weekend. Does the governor know that the president is dead? He does not, as far as we know. I was asked if the governor knew if uh, the president was dead. Uh, he said he did no, not sir, know. I wouldn't attempt to do that. The doctor did a little earlier. Uh, what part of his body was he wounded in? Well, basically, uh, uh, the bullet entered in the back, penetrated the body. Based on the doctor's reconstruction, it came out in front apparently grazed and fractured his wrist and the bullet was spent and remained embedded in the thigh. Correct? Left. 
Sharon. S H A R O N. Harassed by the ages of the children. Sharon is 13. Mark is 11. Are there any further questions? Will there be uh, any further communiques? We will, uh, will there be any further communiques? Uh, will there be any further communiques? Has been asked I would say by one of the reporters. Uh, seven o'clock. Another and, uh, another communique be will be held around seven o'clock, and that will be a, a final communique unless something else is indicated. So seven o'clock will be the final communique yes, for tonight. Are. For your information, gentlemen, we are in the process at this moment of setting up a press office here. And we will have a telephone installed and we'll be able to service you tonight, tomorrow, we hope in a satisfactory manner. He has not, as far as we know, been informed of the president's death. He has not yet regained consciousness after the operation. Well, it's been we asked, any no nerve evidence damage. Of nerve damage. The doctor tells us that as as nearly as can be determined at this time, there in all probability will be no permanent uh, disability of any type, hopefully. Wasn't there one broken rib, Dave? I was asked, uh, I wasn't there, there one broken ribs? ribs. And uh, Julian Reed has answered, there are several shattered ribs. Uh, this has been... Uh, an interview uh, with Julian Reed, uh, who is with Governor Connolly's party, and he is giving the statement from Dr. Robert Shaw, the surgeon, on the very latest condition of Governor Tom Connolly here at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas. Are there any other questions? Uh, Mr. Reed is asked, is there any plan to move him to another hospital has been asked question uh, was raised earlier, Tony. I, I do not know of any plan at the present time. The doctor indicated that he would like to see him remain here for a period of some 10 to uh, 14 days. Yes, that's what he's but this obviously will be uh, subject to the governor's own judgment. <coughs> what members well, of the governor's uh, staff have been brought up here? Here, he was traveling with the governor, as as uh, I was traveling with the governor, and uh, we we hope to have a temporary operation functioning here by in the morning. Well, actually, we're already starting. Some of the telephones are already in. <laughs> I had not heard of the location. We have talked about setting up temporary offices. They are speaking now of uh, the possibility of setting up press offices uh, other than uh, this one are they here. Already off? Yeah. I know they already have started installing telephones. I'm Dr. Robert R. Shaw, professor of thoracic surgery at Southwestern Medical School. Because of my position, I accepted the responsibility of taking care of Governor Connolly uh, following his injury. I want to say at the outset that the condition of the governor is quite satisfactory in view of the injury that he has sustained. He seemed to have been struck by just one bullet which entered the right posterior chest close to the shoulder blade and coursed downward along the chest wall taking out and fragmenting a portion of the fifth rib on the right. The bullet then emerged from the chest, evidently struck his right wrist, fracturing the lower portion of the right radius, and then entered the left thigh where it was spent. The thigh wound is trivial. The fracture of the radius should heal without difficulty or without further disability. Our major problem was the sucking wound of the right chest wall because in making the wound of the chest, the fragments of the fifth rib became what we refer to as secondary missiles and these caused a considerable amount of tissue damage in the 
point where the missile emerged from the chest, when the wound had been enlarged in order to remove damaged tissue, the lung could be inspected. It was found that there was a tear in the middle lobe of the lung, which had to be repaired. There was also a small hole in the lower lobe, undoubtedly due to a small rib fragment. This was of no consequence. The major problem was a matter of completely controlling all bleeding points, removing all damaged muscle and tissue, and then securing a tight closure of the chest wall so that the right lung could be re-expanded. The governor's condition was good during all of this. He was perfectly lucid before anesthesia was started. And from what we know about his injury and his condition at the present time, we have no reason to believe that he won't completely recover without significant disability of any sort. Uh, now reporters who are standing here have uh, asked for questions. I want to know how long he will be required to stay. He will be in the hospital. It will be determined more by the clearing of the bruise to the right lung, and I would estimate that this would be in the neighborhood of 10 to 14 days. This doesn't mean that this injury will be completely clear by this time, but at least we should have a good idea as to the trend of the clearing. The trend of the clearing, uh, whether it is clearing or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked uh, the governor, yes, a uh, reporter asked if the governor knew he was, the president was dead. He said they didn't uh, tell him. No. They're now asking, is he out of surgery and resting comfortably in his room? They are in care of the compound fracture of the right radius. As soon as that is finished, he will be taken to the recovery room where he will be carefully watched until he has regained all of his vital signs. Now, his vital signs are good now, but we like to observe them for a period of time. This is a routine measure until blood pressure is stable, respirations are satisfactory, and until the governor is uh, fully recovered from the anesthesia. In other words, he's fully conscious, responding rationally to questions. They are asking now if a bullet was found uh, in his leg. The bullet is in the leg. It hasn't been removed. This is a very insignificant factor, though. It will be removed. Left eye. But there's no significant injury to the left eye. Before he goes to the recovery room. It was asked, when will it be removed? They're not asking, will, uh, will he stay at this hospital? The doctor says it will be advisable. Has it been definitely determined one bullet? Uh, really, a reconstruction of what must have happened, but assuming, of course, that we know that the government was in, governor was in a sitting position. We know that the wound of entrance is alongside the shoulder blade here, that the wound of exit was here. We speculate that his arm were, perhaps was about in this position and that it fractured his arm here and then went on with him sitting into his left thigh. This is a matter of trying to reconstruct the trajectory of the bullet. He was shot from above and he was in a sitting position. So we feel that this is all one bullet that... Uh, no. The question was asked, yes, did the lung, the lung collapse? Collapse. However, don't stress that point. The lung can be easily re-expanded. It's like a balloon. You can let it down and blow it up again. What are the chances of complications for a man his age? The lung is now re-expanded. Mm -hmm. Was he given a large quantity of blood? Was he given a large quantity of blood? He had lost approximately... 
1,500 cc's of blood. We counted in units, 500 cc's to a unit, and this is what has been given back to him. Quart and a half. Sir, we missed the early part of your uh, diagnosis and your explanation. Would you do it once more for us, please? His general condition, when he was how long will be here? We are still asking questions of uh, Dr. Robert Shaw from the press room of Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas. Ask if he said anything. He uh, said nothing more, however, than an injured man will say. He said that it hurt and don't press too hard in this position and so forth. But he made no statements other than the statements of a normal human being who sustained an injury. Did he remain conscious, the doctor says, perfectly? No. Not in my presence. I wasn't there all the time. Do you anticipate any permanent damage to the doctor? Do you anticipate any permanent damage? Uh, the answer is no, he does not. The van that you see, we are assuming, is the vehicle in which the president's body, this is the undoubtedly the casket that is being brought forth. And from the vantage point that he has down there, ABC's Dick Bate will continue the commentary. Now, accompanied by Secret Service men, it is on a truck, the body of which uh, rises up in the air on a hydraulic lift. This truck has been lifted up to the side of the plane, the back door of the plane. The bronze casket has been pulled off the plane. It is now on the bed of the truck. And the body of President Kennedy is back in Washington. On board this same plane, we're told, is President Johnson. Mrs. Kennedy is supposed to be on the plane as well. The body of the truck has now been lowered down to ground level on hydraulic lift. The bronze casket aboard it. A Navy ambulance is pulling up. The bronze casket carrying President Kennedy's body will be taken from here to Bethesda Naval Hospital. that sometime tomorrow, President Kennedy's body will be taken to the White House for private ceremonies for the family. Then the plan called for President Kennedy's body to be taken to the Capitol, the Capitol Rotunda, for public viewing sometime Sunday. Service escort now lifting the bronze casket off the truck, bringing it down onto the field of Andrews Air Force Base. A Navy honor guard alongside. The casket is now being put into a gray Navy ambulance. Mrs. Kennedy is now coming down, following the casket. With her, other members of the Kennedy family, the Attorney General can be seen. Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, have accompanied the casket back here to Washington are now getting in the ambulance. We'll go with the body to Bethesda Naval Hospital. President Kennedy used on all of his trips around the world. And now with the 
sorrowing Mrs. Kennedy accompanying the body of her husband. The Navy ambulance pulls away from the airfield here, heads toward the Bethesda Naval Hospital. Johnson, who's supposed to be on this same plane. The word here from the Pentagon is that uh, President Johnson will have a statement to make here at the airport. Officials at the Department of Defense were in touch with the aircraft by radio as it made its way back to Washington from Texas. steps have been rolled up to the same back door of the jet airliner. President Johnson is expected to come down in just a moment. Coming down the steps now, now down on the ground. Mrs. Johnson with him. President Johnson coming over to the microphone, accompanied by military aides, Secret Service men. Security precautions here at the airport have been redoubled tonight. President Johnson has called a special meeting of congressional leaders. We're told there's a possibility of a cabinet meeting at the White House tonight. Members of cabinet here at the airport. Members of the diplomatic colony in Washington. And a crowd of average citizens who turned out to pay their respects to President Kennedy's return to Washington. The ambulance carrying the casket has gone on into the city and President Johnson is now before the microphones for his first public statement as President of the United States. President Johnson is beside him, the first lady now. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we take you to the microphones. And in the background of the noise here, they're still standing, the pictures are being taken. He is not ready to speak at the moment. We will watch and see just as soon as he is ready to speak. Another word is being given to him at the present time. And Lyndon Johnson is still standing there. They're looking at the plane, the people gathered around, the officials. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. It is a sad time for all people. We have suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. For me, it is a deep personal tragedy. I know that the world shares the sorrow that Mrs. Kennedy and her family bear. I will do my best. That is all I can do. I ask for your help and God. Those words? From the new President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. Of the people of the United States, and for God's help, he is asked that we join him in this hour of his trial, as well as that of the family of the President, or the former President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. Lyndon Johnson has made his first public statement since being sworn in as President of the United States. He said that he will do the best he can 
and he asked for the support and guidance of all Americans. He's now talking with congressional leaders who have met the plane at the airport. We understand that he has called for a meeting tonight at the White House. congressional leaders and possibly a cabinet meeting. With President Johnson is his wife. He's having a few quick words now with some of the members of the leadership of Congress who have come out to the airport. President Johnson was obviously Morning, the passing of President Kennedy. His statement was very short. He's now leaving. He will go directly to a helicopter if the plan follows, where he and Mrs. Johnson will be taken directly to the White House. The helicopter is standing by right here at Andrews Air Force Base. The trip shouldn't take more than 10 minutes or so. last words just before he enters the helicopter. As I said before, security precautions have been redoubled here tonight. Mrs. Johnson and President Johnson climbing up the steps into a Marine helicopter accompanied by members of his staff. They will go now directly to the White House. The crowds are being kept well back away from the place where President Johnson made his remarks, and now they've been kept well back away from the area where the helicopter will take off. Turbine, turbine helicopter, and it is prepared to take off momentarily. 